All right. Happy Sunday. Welcome to the Sunday show here on the line. I'm Matt Delaney joining this week for the first time in seemingly forever. Katie Montgomery, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. First time since you, lockdown, I think, in like 2020 you, or something. <laughs> you look bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to jump in and uh, take callers. So really quickly, yeah. this is the, the line network and there's plenty of other shows there. We'll go through those announcements, and everything else, but primarily most of the shows here are calling shows. This is the premiere show on Sunday where people can call in and talk about why they believe in gods or other supernatural things. Uh, anything along those lines is preferred. So theists will always get priority. So if you have a good reason why you think that a God exists and why you think other people should believe this or anything along those lines, by all means, 720-619-2288. And there's a link down in the description so that you can use a a web, uh, web hosted call in system uh, to reach us there. But we're not going to waste any more time. We're starting. This is Sunday. And here we go. Calling in from Sweden, we have uh, Peter, pronouns are he, him, who wants to talk about why he needs God and why he thinks others also need God. So welcome, Peter. Thank you. Howdy. Hi. Peter, why do you need God? What does that mean? Well, for me, it's very simple. Uh huh. Go for it. Explain it. Hello. We've dropped uh, your sound out, Peter. Oh, maybe Peter's dropped oh, no. from the call. Oh, that is unfortunate. Peter has dropped maybe was, from the call list. It was so simple. <laughs> We've just Let's instantly get... communicated to us. <laughs> Peter was going to say, "It's so simple. I don't even need to explain it to you. I'm just going to leave." Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's let's give Peter a, a minute to call back. Um, maybe maybe he does truly need God, and as there isn't that God, he's just <laughs> stopped existing. I, I desperately need God to keep my call connected long enough for me to explain <laughs> what I need God for. Uh, on that note, I'm at, while because I want to give Peter you know the chance to to call back in yeah, and get through back. right away. So. In, in the meantime, let me just go ahead and do the normal uh, announcements here of what's going on with the Line Network. First of all, links and all of the other information you need to down below in the description, patreon.com slash call the line. Uh, you can become a channel member here on YouTube. You can go to um, linemerch.com where we have sweaters and um, wine mugs and all of those things. You can also go to um, qnaline.com. Uh, and that's where you can apply to be on some of the shows that are coming up, like End Boss, which is a one-hour uh, debate format, which I'll be happy to go through later. But in addition to this program, there are shows many of the other days of the week. On Mondays, it is Skep Talk, and tomorrow it'll be Shannon Q with Maya Adkinson. So there's your chance to turn in um, and have discussions that don't necessarily center around religion or don't necessarily center around lgbtq issues but focus more on science and pseudoscience things like that so if you have views in those areas that are just not normally accepted or that you think that the the skeptic minded individuals might reject monday's skeptic is a time to call him with that uh wednesdays on the hang up uh i'll be back that's my wednesday night show which primarily focuses more on political uh issues than it does religion, but on all the shows that I'm on, uh, theists will always have top priority in the call queue. I'll be joined by Dara, the, Ma the Magic Skeptic, this week. Um, also, on Thursday, the Transatlantic Call-In Show will be Arden and Luxander, and so this is your chance to call in with any questions or concerns or issues that you have about trans rights in general. If you're somebody who's been called a transphobe and it it irritates you or you don't think it's fair you can call in and discuss why you think that's happening if you're if you're proud that you're a transphobe you can call in and explain that uh if you prefer the term gender critical as opposed to transphobe you can call in and explain that and on many of the weeks my wonderful co-host here katie will be there one of the og tacos hosts as well 
Uh, Friday, we're expecting an episode of Hostility hosted by John Gleason uh, with guest Rebecca Witzman. And today's call screener is Dragon. And we have uh, a number of uh, wonderful moderators in the chat, but I have vamped long enough. And Peter from Sweden is back on the show. Thank you so much for calling Peter. back. Yeah, we, we didn't I'm hear so anything sorry. you said, so please start again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. My electricity in my apartment totally went out exactly when you were taking in the phone call. So maybe it was a sign from God actually. that I shouldn't call in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe. So, Peter, yeah, you know, why do you so, need God and what yeah. does that mean? Well, I I feel like I need God to um, make sense of things. That's kind of like how, how I feel. And I also feel like I, I need him to um, feel a part of this world, if that makes any sense. Um. I get so as someone who like I don't feel like I need God for those things. So I I feel like I'm a part of this world. I mean, I, literally we're both a part of this world, but also I feel like I contribute to society some, you know, I try and influence politics the best I can and I I help my friends and family and stuff. And I don't know everything that happens in the world and I don't understand most things in fact, but I understand a lot of stuff and I've wow. never felt like I need God to understand it. So I, I'm not trying to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's ridiculous. I'm just saying, I, I personally don't really fully understand what you're, why you feel like you no, need God. No, I totally understand it. I, 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 think it's, I, I think it's kind of hard to talk about for two reasons, because it's a very personal experience. And I also feel like uh, I don't know if you need God or Matt needs God. I am saying I need God. And I think others that are like looking for something to put a crutch on their life or maybe like some guidance would need God. I think strong individual people maybe don't need God, but other people that are, I'm, I'm not going to call myself weaker, but yeah, weaker in a way needs God in a different way. So I I feel like I understand what you're saying in that sense. I guess I wouldn't want to say, oh, you know, some people feel like they need religion because they're desperate and religion kind of offers them false hope and stuff. I mean, that is kind of, to be honest, that is kind of what I feel. And I feel like lots, some religions do kind of manipulate people uh, into getting money and stuff by offering them quite some kind of fake hope where they feel like they need hope. I wouldn't want to mm -hmm. accuse an individual person of that. I wouldn't want to say, Peter, you've been blindly tricked and you're an idiot and you've fallen for this stuff. Because that's, you know, that's not <laughs> true and you're not necessarily saying saying anything like that. But I guess um, there could be some things where people feel really bad and the idea of a god gives them comfort. So, like, if you yeah. lost a loved one, maybe the idea of god taking them off to some nice place makes you feel better. Do you think it's that kind of thing? Or do you feel more like you are anxious that you don't understand where the universe came from? And so you've just decided that the best thing for you is to just believe in something. Which, or both? That is good. Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. But primarily, it's for me, it's a guidance. I feel like, especially when, uh, so I'm 45 years old and I'm alone a lot of the time of uh, the days I have, I feel like it's a good uh, thing to have God in my life, to have someone to talk to, to trust, to um, guide me in my ways. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm a an uh, unperfect human being, and I, I feel like God is helping me through those days that are like the darkest. I, I have loads of questions, and I, and I type some yeah, of them in, because I, I am, I, I'm with Katie in the sense that I can understand why people um, feel that they benefit. So does the God that you need exist 
or do you just need the concept? I mean, you're, you're saying God provides guidance and is someone to talk to. So does God mm -hmm. talk back? And how does God provide you guidance? Is it an external God, or does merely the concept allow you to guide yourself more accurately? Uh, that's a good question for me. Uh, it comes back to uh, the Holy Books. I have read the Book of Mormon. I have read the Quran. I have read the Bible. And I feel like the Bible has been the biggest guidance for me. So I would say God talks to me through the Bible. Well, let's say there is no God, just, just for the sake of argument for a second. Um, sure. and, and you're reading the Bible. And so you feel you're getting mm -hmm. guidance. It seems to me that in that case, you're not you're clearly not getting guidance from a God. You're getting guidance from people's thoughts and writings about a God, whether it exists or not. Well, I feel like God guided me to the Bible, if that makes any sense. You feel like God guess, guided you to the Bible? Yeah, I guess mm -hmm. my question is, like, you've read several of the holy books. Yeah. I, I guess you could just, like, if anyone, the first, you know, there are lots of people on Earth who have only read one or zero or s part of one holy book. And mm -hmm. lots of them mm -hmm. might feel like that God guided them to that book. And yeah. so I guess, how would you, I mean, I, you, it feels like you're going to say, you know, it's all just feeling and it's hard for you to explain. But yeah, how would you differentiate the difference between stumbling into the Bible or just clicking the most with the Bible or maybe growing up in a country where most of the people the there Bible are is, is the big book. Yeah, no, that's a very good, good question. I think, I think this is very, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to answer, I guess. Um, I think, I think everybody has their way to God in a way. And I think, I don't, think less of Mormons uh, or Jehovah's Witness or oh, uh, <laughs> Scientology or whatever. Yeah. If that helps you to uh, live a better life, I don't see why you shouldn't do it or read that scripture that helps you yeah. in your... I, yeah. I agree. It, it, you know, if there's, if there's something that is harmless to you and other people and it's some little tradition you have or it's some tradition someone else has that you've picked up on that's you know fine we could argue that uh, you know maybe there's unforeseen circumstances blah 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 but in general if you're not harming other people then it's not really a problem and there are stupid traditions that everyone participates in they just kind of blindly do sure, but by christmas i think yeah um but i think that um there's one concern is that Lots of these, well, all of these religions, at least by some people, are used as the primary excuse to do horrific things. And in all of yeah. the holy books, they do actually suggest quite strongly doing horrific things and legitimize yeah. really horrific things. If you look things. in the Old Testament, you have a multiple, uh, uh, yeah, like slavery in the Old Testament is very clearly uh, both. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have rules to have your slaves and uh, what, things like that. And that's a you know, terrible, if, terrible thing to do to have slaves today. Yeah. If like so, potentially one one possibility is God has guided you to this book that has mm -hmm. kind of written evidence of Him doing something absolutely horrific, and then has granted you with the ability to understand those things are bad, so to ignore the advice there, but to take some other advice from the bible or mm -hmm. maybe you've stumbled across this book which has some good bits in it and some terrible bits in it and the good bits kind of vibe with you so you're like yeah this is cool and the bad bits you just kind of like yeah not i'm just going to pretend they're not there um it's not like i don't pretend they're there but uh, it, i this is again a feeling thing it's it's hard for me to explain but I feel most uh, willing to follow Jesus in the uh, New Testament. Of course, I, I am aware that the Old Testament is there. And of course, there's thing in there that I don't follow and you shouldn't follow. Uh, but I, I think it's, yeah, sorry. 
No, that's okay. I was just going to say, you say you shouldn't follow it, and I totally agree. Mm -hmm. But, like, who, who's deciding which bits are the bits that are good to follow and the bits that are bad to follow? Cause I guess it's, it's got, my like, morals? God, yeah, so if God is guiding you, and, like, you know, God, if God, if God is real, God is the one who, mm -hmm. like, turned a woman to salt because she turned around and watched him doing a genocide and He's the one who, you know, murdered every single animal created with a flood for some reason. At, Except, and you've looked yeah. at that and you're like, I'm actually more moral than this God because I don't yeah. think slavery is good. But also mm -hmm. you're taking advice from it. Yeah, I, I, I can see that as uh, problematic. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I, I guess I, I feel like it's yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I need to take. I, I, I need to take I, a step back for a second. Problematic. I need to take a step back for a second, Peter, because yeah, it, does it matter to you whether or not the God of the Bible is actually real? Does that matter, or is it just the concept and the writings and what you interpret out of it and how you is all of that enough, or does it matter whether the God is real? No, it matters because of what I believe comes after death. Okay, so you have a belief about what comes after death, and it matters to you whether this God is real. How could we demonstrate yeah. that your the God you believe in is real? I don't think you can. Okay, so if it matters to you whether it's real, and there's no way to demonstrate that it's real, then that means you mm -hmm. have no reason to believe it's real. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I appreciate yeah. that. I, you, you've almost put me at a complete loss for words. So if we're in a position <laughs> where it matters to you if the God is real and you have no way to tell whether it's real and you acknowledge that that means that you have no reason to believe it's real, do you actually believe that God is real? Or do you just want to believe? Yeah, I, I think it's more that I want to believe, I guess. Okay. That, I appreciate the answer, and it's it, it, it's far more honest than we get a lot of times um, with people. I appreciate the interaction. But here's the thing. If now you're in the position where you believe something because you want to believe that it's real, and you acknowledge that it may not be, then... How can you view yourself as someone who genuinely cares about the truth if you are willingly believing in something that you can't demonstrate, that you don't think there's any way to demonstrate, merely because it makes you feel yeah. good? If somebody else were in I a similar I'm, position, yeah. if, if somebody else were in a similar position with, let's say, mm -hmm. a God you don't believe in, and they said, hey, I believe in Vishnu because it makes me feel good. And you're like, well, I believe in Jesus because that's the one that makes me feel good. How do the two mm -hmm. of you propose to resolve this conflict? Yeah, I, gu I guess there isn't any solution. I guess I'm also very much afraid of the consequences if I stop believing. Oh, that feels are way are you afraid of consequences from all of those other gods that you don't believe in? Because if you pick the wrong Did one... There, yes. In, in a way, I am. So, so if you're afraid of, of consequences from gods you don't believe in, and you've picked one, why wouldn't it be better to not pick any of them? To just say, I'm going to wait and not select which god I believe in until one of them demonstrates that it's real. Because I don't want to be in the position of pissing off the real one by believing in a fake one. Okay, so let's say you have a hundred... Uh, 100% of a cake. I, I'm going to go with the cake uh, thing here. Okay. And let's say I, yeah, I love cake. Who doesn't love cake? Uh, and I, 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 I think it's probably a little like, I feel like uh, reading the, the words of God in different books and praying to him is a little like eating cake. And I feel like when I do it, I get something out of it. I understand that other people don't like cake. But for me, it's important to have cake in my life. 
Yeah, but the cake that you're liking is it real? God. <laughs> <laughs> you're like imagine there's a there's a real cake there the cake being the thoughts of people that people have written down about god and you're consuming that cake but part of the consumption of that cake is you believe that that cake was baked by jehovah and somebody else believes that yeah. cake was baked by zeus and somebody else believes that cake was based you know it was it was baked by vishnu and my position is i see the cake i d trust me I don't know the Bible as well as I used to, but I have read it, studied it, te taught it, uh, taught against it. Um, I can list off 20 things that are absolutely vile and disgusting within the Bible just right off the mm -hmm. top of my head. And then I can also Raisins. list things that are potentially, <laughs> there's no mayo in the Bible. Um, yeah. <laughs> I can list things that are potentially um, good in the Bible too. And But the yeah. good things in the Bible and the, and the good lessons that we learn that you benefit from, they exist in other writings and they are true or not true and they are beneficial or not beneficial independent of whether or not there's a God. So why mm. would anybody believe, hey, and by the way, it, if you believe in, the, in, in Jesus because that's the one that makes you feel good, why won't Jesus confirm his existence to you? Let's set aside whether or not he should confirm it to anybody and everybody, which I think he should. But here you are, you're mm. a person who has studied a handful of religious books. You don't think there's any way to demonstrate mm -hmm. which one is right, but one of them resonates more with you. If, if it was important, yeah. and it's important who has the right understanding of God, why isn't God, mm. whatever God it is, doing anything to help us have a, an accurate understanding? Yeah, I don't really have a good answer for that, to be honest, Matt. And I, I don't think, yeah. And something else, if you're like, if part of your motivation is worrying about the consequences of not believing in God. So obviously, you know, the Christian God mm. says you'll go to hell if you don't believe in me, and you'll go to heaven if you do. Um, like even just looking at Christian theology. There's, there's this thing called the devil, according to them, or Satan or whatever, which tries to trick people into following it by like making them feel mm. good. And that's kind of ends up in bad stuff happening, allegedly. So how could you know whether you were not just, you know, following the right God or not, but that you may be just following Satan or some equivalent of some evil or even an evil God? That wants you mm. to believe that it's like, oh yeah, if you if you do what I say, then you'll feel nice, and then you're like, you feel nice, and you're like, mm. oh, I like this God, and then it's like, cool, right, you're going <laughs> to hell. You know, it could be lying. Yeah. It could be the deceiver, um, potent like potentially, as far as you know, because you haven't necessarily got proof that it's the good one. Yeah, no, I I actually totally agree. I could be tricked. It's it's a dangerous uh, position to be in because I, I I know this is a bit of a stupid comment, but I'm going to say it anyway because I've been on the show in ages. Uh, whenever anyone brings up this kind of uh, comment about being worried about the consequences, it's it's like a classic mm. uh, experiment thought experiment thing called Pascal's Wager, and I just like to introduce yeah, people to my that. God, which I believe in, where everyone goes to heaven apart from people making Pascal's Wager. So. <laughs> They, and they go to hell. So you have yeah. to be careful which god you pick, because if anyone who is Pascal's wagering any of the gods, they're the ones going to hell. Um, but yeah, I guess the, the I, danger I, I, is... I when... think I'm getting to be a Kateolichan. Is that your religion? <laughs> I think... We definitely need to come ultimate... up with a name for it. <laughs> yeah, Kateolichan. I think that's a good name. Ultimately, well, the danger is is that not that like because yeah. you can if you believe in things that you don't know are true, then you might yeah. end up believing in something you don't know whether it's true or not, which can cause harm. Like theoretically, that could be the case. Like people believe in QAnon and you know all kinds of wacky stuff. Not not saying your belief in God is one step away from that, but also totally. you can end up. Like when you kind of placing, you're saying you're giving it advice, it gives you advice. And when you kind of mm -hmm. place all of your advice eggs in one basket, it could 
end up giving you bad advice. And if you're in a position where I feel I am, where, you know, if I hear advice and someone's like, oh, this is in the Bible, then I consider it on its merits rather than where it's come from. Then you're more free to work out whether the advice is good or bad. I feel like then you have one less sort of corrupting influence on on the weight of whether that evidence is good or bad. So I, I sure. guess that's my but, but one of the reasons I I, I uh, this is maybe a very bad reason, but one of the reasons why I also feel a little more connected to the religious part of Christianity is also because of uh, my political uh, sense. I feel like a lot of of my political beliefs maybe concur more with uh, the Bible as well. And I, I don't know if that's interfering in my belief or helping me in the belief or, yeah. Well, I, I was about to move on because um, I, I appreciate all the honesty, but basically, you know, t to quote Stevie Wonder, when you believe in things that you don't understand, then you suffer. And, and you're, hmm. you're basically advocating for believing things you don't understand. But now we've moved into a new area where you are, because you have certain political views that you feel are best represented by, I guess, Jesus, that's why the Jesus story or the Jesus character and all that stuff is more appealing to you. Without trying mm. to turn this into a let's keep Peter on for 12 hours and bash everything that he holds, what would you say <laughs> is like your number one political position that makes you feel like the version of Christianity you're accepting is right and, and consistent with your political view? Uh, I think it's definitely turned the other cheek. No joke. That's a I political view? Well, in a way, it's, it's, I'm very against war, for example. I, uh, I have always been a pacifist. Uh, for me, that's been a very hard thing to, I have a dad that's a military uh, guy and my mom uh, is in the military. Uh, I've grown up in a military family. I've been all over the world because of that. And I have been very privileged in that way. But it's also something that has made me very secure that like being a pacifist is the right way. It's like turn the other cheek, actually uh, love your neighbor as yourself, as it says in the Bible. And that's yeah, so important for me. Well, the Bible has a particular understanding of neighbor. And uh, in the Bible, God commands the Israelites to basically run around waging war on a number of different groups and completely slaughtering them and taking their stuff. The Hittites, the yeah, Midianites, the Amalekites. Yeah. So if you're a pacifist and, and you know, um, love thy neighbor and turn the other cheek, that's about who, 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 so within Christianity, generally your neighbor is other Christians and that you're not supposed to have communion with you know, the heathen that surrounds you. You're supposed to buy your slaves from the heathen that surround you. But even sure. Jesus um, doesn't advocate for pacifism. He literally handcrafts a scourge, leather straps with, you know, glass particles in there to make a, 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 a scathing whip and runs through the temple, mm. violently beating all the moneylenders. What on earth makes you think that this Bible or this Jesus character is remotely a pacifist? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think I'm more focused on like when he says what is the biggest commandment? He says like love God and, and love thy neighbor. And I've taken that as being nice to someone else and not taking them or killing them or something like that. Here's a weird little thing because, because you went with yeah. something that, that I've heard many times and that I used to say myself, which is, you know, and it, it occurs 
in, in well, I don't know if this one occurs in several places, but this one definitely occurs in in Matthew. I think chapter twenty two because it's not in the it's not in the Sermon on the Mount. But when he's asked, um, and he says, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Here's mm -hmm. my thing. We you you've acknowledged that you're a pacifist, that you're opposed to war, that mm -hmm. you like turn the other mm -hmm. cheek, you like uh love your neighbor as yourself. And so what mm -hmm. you're talking about is um how humans should interact with each other. And I'm largely in agreement with you. And by the way, so is secular humanism, which you should look into because I find it vastly superior to anything in the Bible. But when Jesus is asked Sorry, what, what, what the greatest I, commandment I, I, is, secular, secular humanism, said, they're, secular. They're, oh, humanism. Okay. okay, you should definitely look up secular humanism. And there's three different secular humanist manifestos that, that go through the principles of this. But let me finish this. Um, when Jesus says the, the most important thing is to love the Lord thy God. Why is that the most important thing? How can it be the case that the most important commandment is to love something that you can't demonstrate exists, you don't know exists, does not interact with human beings at all. How does that take priority over treat people with respect and dignity? How does that take priority over don't own people as property? How does that take priority over yeah. don't wage war and terrorize people and kill them all, but keep the virgin girls for yourself and your friends? Yeah. No, I totally get it. That's a very good point. And one of the things I really want to say, and then I will go, uh, is one of the things I hate most about uh, religion is how bigoted people get, especially against like trans people and that uh, aspect of it as well. Is it, it hurts me very well, uh, very much to see that people use God against people that are trans. And I am saying this because Katie is here, of course, and I love her to bits. So I've seen her loads on YouTube and things like that. And I just want to, uh, from my part of religion, apologize for what Christianity has done to people like that. I don't think you need to Christian. apologize, Peter, because no, obviously I, you're a I, nice person, but also you can't apologize for it because you know you you're saying you you believe in it but also you know some of the bits of it are bad and stuff and then mm -hmm. you kind of saying sorry for it doesn't i mean you you, you haven't like atoned for it. i'm not i'm not saying your apology is rubbish you know thank you for your kind sentiment but at the same time like this religion is totally out of your control um and yeah. it's it's a huge force and there's it evolves very slowly, though it does evolve. And, you know, it's going to do what it wants to do. It's like a, you know, a population level force that is out of any one person's control. Um, but certainly the things written I still down. I think it's sad, though. Lots of it's I, horrible. I still I mean, think it's sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, think... it, it, I mean, it's sad, but it, it doesn't matter how many times anyone apologizes if the book recommends slavery. I accept your apology, Peter. I, I don't need an apology from you, but I don't. I can't accept any apology from the Bible or any representative of God, the God that apparently created childhood cancer, because it is so immoral. I couldn't forgive it if it's real. So there, I, I'm meme. not trying to be horrible. <laughs> no, there's no, a I meme. Totally get it. There's a meme that's made the rounds, which is you can't love someone and vote for someone who will hurt them, and so. Yeah, you're you're in a similar situation. I'm not, you know, I'm sure you're a perfectly wonderful person. I appreciate what you said on this. I appreciate your honesty and everything else. But if you continue to identify as a Christian, you will be spending the rest of your days apologizing for shit that you didn't mm -hmm. start, but yet you still support in some way. So here's what the the thing I'll leave you with, and then I'm gonna move on mm -hmm. to other callers. Go look into yeah, secular so humanism. Time. Go, go look into secular humanism and specifically try to figure out what objections you have to humanism. What is humanism yeah. missing that you need that keeps you from identifying as a humanist? Um, yeah. And because I'd love to know. I will. Yeah. And again, uh, I'm sorry for taking so long and thank you no, for fine. calling and talking to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. My pleasure. Good, Thanks, Peter. Peter.
we'd have hang up on you if we didn't like you. <laughs> yeah. And and sometimes with an incredible quickness. So we started yeah. <laughs> off the show, the 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 line network uh Sunday show here. Katie's first one back, and we managed to get a theist caller from Sweden, um, who admittedly has a well, is a, is a rather peculiar individual in the sense that seemingly completely honest in, in answering the questions, um, acknowledging what they can and can't prove, acknowledging that this is about what they feel they prefer and it's based on other things and that they have lots of problems. With. It, it is refreshing. And it's one of those things where we all know that the world is full of Christians and Muslims and other people who we disagree with on whether or not there is a God and that there are Christians who object to things in the Bible and things within Christendom. And there are Muslims that object to things in the Quran and things within the larger Islamic, you know, it's, it's not like every Muslim is, uh, is an Islamist or an Islamic fundamentalist or a jihadist or, or, you know, there's different branches and different schools of thought. They're not all advocating for child brides the way, uh, one of my former debate opponents was. And this is why it's for near 19 years next month, um, I've been doing live call-in shows on these subjects. And sometimes the calls go great. And sometimes they're a disaster. And yet uh, nothing about my, my thoughts on religion or Katie's thoughts on religion has um, dramatically shifted. We still expect Hey, here's a question. Do you have, are you able to meet the burden of proof? Do you have good reasons for your belief? And what confuses me is how good people like Peter acknowledge that they don't have a good reason to believe something and that the thing they're believing is problematic at best. Um, and yet they're, they're going to keep going with it because they get something out of it. I, I've said for years, take all the good, true, wonderful things that you find wherever you find them. If you find them in Christianity and they're good and true, keep them. If you find them in Islam and they're good and true, keep them. If you find them in Scientology, well, I don't know what the fuck you did, but keep them <laughs> anyway um, and throw the rest of it out because that yeah. part's not needed. And that, to some extent, is what resulted in, in, in building up things like secular humanism of saying, hey, we need... Whether or not there is a God, we are essentially sharing space on this planet and we have to interact. And what I do is going to impact your life. What you do is going to impact my life. And we need to find ways to cooperate and work together. That, that's, that's the foundation of humanism. We have a lot more calls. Um, if you're a theist with uh, thoughts that you'd like to share as well, you can call 720-619-2288. Uh, and you can also go to callinstudio.com slash show slash um the sunday show or no slash, slash the line wow the, the link line. cut off so i missed it the sunday show all right <laughs> well you've successfully reached other people in in england because jonesy's calling from england uh pronto he him to, to let us know that we need a savior so jonesy welcome you're on with katie and matt hi matt how are you doing i'm, I'm all right can you hear me matt I hear yeah, we can hear you well, matt Actually, your mic's yeah, a little good, too good. strong. Look, it, 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 your mic's just a little place. too strong. If it's possible to move your mouth just a little farther away from it, maybe, because uh, kind of overdrive. Is this a better, bit. Matt? I think so. Is this better? I think so. Yeah. What I was yeah. going to say, yeah, we need a savior. We do. We need a savior. Uh, from savior what? From what the, and to what? Well, to save us from the eternal death that we're going to go to if we don't have a savior. This is why the Lord Jesus was parachuted into this world so that he could die on the cross so that we could come back to the Father through his sacrificial death and be born again and get to live for eternity in paradise. So we need, do you mean we need a savior from the system that God created? Your God created? Well, he's your God as well. So you're, he's every, no, well, okay. I don't have, a, but the one don't have you a God believe I'm not convinced for God. He's the creator. Whether you believe it yeah, or yeah, not, okay, he's actually the creator. Jonesy, what I meant was, yeah. you, you're saying that what we need saving from is eternal damnation or eternal death or whatever. But that that whole thing, the concept, like <sighs> eternal death, is something God created, right? 
It's just the way it is, whether God created it or not. I mean, God this, is, this is how it is. That is, that is what happened, right? God, like God, create, God created hell, Look, God created heaven, God created life, God created death. That, that's right, isn't it? God created the, the universe, the trillions of galaxies and the different dimensions. Yeah. He created and God everything. Created, God created eternal death, God created suffering, God created all those things, right? No, look, when Adam and Eve, when they ate the piece of fruit in the garden, yeah? And we yeah, but fell, God created the garden and he created the fruit. Thing. Yeah, but God, God but created when... all of this stuff, everything. Yeah, but, but, but we were the ones. Uh, we no, 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 the just, ones who... Jonesy, I'm not trying to trip but you up. We were... The reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, you're saying we need a saviour. And we do. And we asked what from. Yeah, yeah. So we, we asked what from. And you said, you know, eternal death and suffering and all that kind of stuff. But that was all created Look, we, by God. So what you're saying is we need a savior from God. No, we need a savior from ourselves. We're the ones who fucked up. We need you, someone. Jonesy, but God created well, us. How do, how do you know that? And how do you know that there's going to be eternal damnation as a consequence? Look, nobody truly knows anything, but I believe it. It's just what I no, believe. No, sir, that's not true. No, <laughs> not no, true. People, know, people know plenty of things, but you're calling in to this show to tell us that we need a Savior, that that's the way it is, and we need a Savior because of what we've done. And I'm asking you, how do you know that's true? And your answer is nobody knows anything. Then why should I care what you say? If you're acknowledging that you're saying things that you don't know, and you can't demonstrate, why should anybody care what you say? Matt, Jonesy. I feel like Roy Scheider in Jaws. I feel like Roy Scheider in Jaws, trying to talk to the Amity Towns Board, or whatever they're called in America, the Board of Commerce, saying, look, there's a great white shark out there. Don't go in the sea. Yeah. But he yeah. had seen the shark, right? right? He had evidence you know of the what? shark. You we can, can prove there are Look, sharks. Shark. It, no, no, Jonesy, what? Jonesy, Jonesy, we know there are sharks. We can prove there are sharks. And you, the, the, the protagonist in Jaws demonstrated that he was correct. You're basically showing up at the meeting saying, I think there's a shark out there. I think it's a super shark. To just stop talking, Jonesy. That's just the way it is. Okay. I can't prove it. Nobody knows anything. The council should throw you out for wasting their time. Look, Matt. Just bring a fake though. Am I speaking Jonesy. now? Yeah. yeah. What's Listen, that? Matt, Matt. As always. Matt, can you hear me? I, you know what? Matt, I don't want to hear you. What? J Jonesy, is you there a reason why you keep... Matt, just Jonesy? shut up. Uh, all right, I'm going to mute you. You don't ever fucking tell me to shut up on my show. But I'd like to ask why you're, you keep saying Matt, 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 instead of Katie. Do you have a problem talking to Katie or addressing Katie by name? I can't see her. I'm on a cellular tablet, Matt. All I can see is a white screen and hear your fucking voice, you dumb cunt. Okay, you dumb cunt. You're gone. Jonesy, Bye. You're not upset. I think Jonesy needs a savior from himself anyway. <laughs> Jonesy and I are both <laughs> dumb cunts. I Jonesy, love, I love saved Katie. you. Yeah, I, I agree with Katie, <laughs> yeah, Jonesy. I, I have saved you from yourself. I expect you to worship me and to send me money. And by the way, for all those of you who are watching, you don't have to worship, but you do have to send us money. Actually, you don't have to, but I'm going to try to do what I can to encourage it. And you can do that by uh, joining, subscribing to the Line Network here on YouTube. You can go to patreon.com slash call the line and contribute there. And you can go to Line Merch and actually get something out of it, including, uh, I don't know, I wonder if Arden has this little... A graphical display of the hoodies that we have up there, along with the line t shirt wow. and the merch. Oh, look at that. Literally the best hoodies the I've ever seen. And by the way, the letters on those uh, pink and yellow hoodies there are GFY for Go Fuck Yourself, Jimmy, and YGH for your gay homie for me, because evidently <laughs> I'm gay. Uh, so, Jonesy, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that. Um, you're staring at a white screen and all you could hear was my dumb uh, mouth. Uh, but it's really disrespectful for me to have a guest host on here who's actually talking and engaging to you. And you're just like, but Matt, but Matt, but Matt, but Matt, but Matt. I, I know my name, Jonesy. I also know that when somebody comes in to say we, nobody knows anything uh, and that we are desperately in need of something, if, I, if you can't come up with a way for people to distinguish what you say 
from what somebody else says to determine what the truth is, then you should be dismissed. And, it, and by the way, you're not actually showing up at the city council saying there's a huge shark out there. You're saying there's a magical being out there that is going to torture you forever or send you to be tortured forever unless you listen to me and help me establish a church and give me your money and do me. Because you know, um, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. And yet we've not got a single word or a piece, a scrap of evidence from any God ever. All I keep hearing is from people calling in to tell me how I need to repent. Well, I did repent, walked down the aisle at the age of five, accepted Jesus into my heart, was an active Southern Baptist and occasionally uh, leanings toward Pentecostal stuff for a number of years. I have studied the Bible, I have taught it, I have preached it, and now I'm sitting here saying, we need more. It's not enough to just say, ah, this is what I learned in Sunday school, therefore it's true. It's not enough to say, this is what appears in the Bible, therefore it's true. It's not enough to say, this is what my church taught, therefore it's true. And yet Jonesy did exactly that by saying, that's just the way it is and nobody knows anything. Well, I hate to tell you, mate, but people do know things. We don't have absolute certainty. We can't demonstrate everything, but we do know things. I I absolutely love it when people making arguments come in with an analogy that directly is the exact opposite of what they want to say. Like to say, I feel like this character in a film that no one believed, who was providing evidence and then was proved right by like direct demonstration. Yeah. It's like that's literally quite literally what we want you to do and what you are not doing. Yeah. <laughs> it is perfect. Um, you know what you sorry, need, Jonesy? Yeah. You know what Jonesy needs? Jonesy needs a bigger boat. <laughs> I was just going to do a quick little interjection just because I've noticed that there are 2,100 people watching right now on YouTube, but this video only has 40 likes. <laughs> I think we can get a couple more than 40 likes on the video when there are 2,000 people watching. Mine shows 346, but it may be slow to a refresh. Oh. But if there's 2,104 people watching, then we should have 2,104 likes because uh, we, on, we know you all love it. But, yeah. Well done. Thank you. All right. Uh, wow. Um, yeah, we got loads of theistic callers. So Art in Pennsylvania is a theist who's calling to ask my opinion of a Bible passage. Ooh, wow. How you doing, Art? Welcome to the show. Good, Matt. Nice spirit, by the way. Um, Thank you. What I'm, you're welcome. What, what I'm interested in is you, you, you. I've often seen you go to slavery as you know as a an abomination. I have no problem with that. But it seems to me that Matthew 15, 1 to four is pretty bad too, and that's Jesus speaking. So I'm wondering if you have a different take on it because Jesus says in Matthew 15, 1 to four, God commanded. Yep. A child who curses a parent should be put to death. I mean, that sounds pretty bad to me. So I'm wondering if, if there's another spin or something I'm missing. Um, there's well, there's always another another spin. Uh, I'm not going to dig in with an answer for you here because you stumbled across something that I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing a video series that I don't want to say what it is exactly because i think it's this is going to sound terrible no spoilers. i i think it is genuinely such a good idea that if i say it out loud two or three or four or five people will steal the idea and do it before i even get the first video done but it involves going through some passages like this um on specifically on matthew 15 this is when the pharisees and the scribes are, are are coming and saying, hey, you know, why don't your guys wash their hands when they eat? And Jesus is basically telling them, um, you know, why do you guys break commandments for your tradition? Why is it that when God says, honor your father and mother and whoever, you know, reviles their father and mother will be put to death, you guys, you Pharisees and scribes say um, something different. And yeah. it, what it is, is it's it's jesus showing that he can that the people who are running around claiming to be righteous on behalf or more righteous than others 
are just as likely to be hypocritical and they are in fact hypocritical about a number of different things. It's a weird passage because there's no circumstances under which Jesus, who's purportedly God in all of this, could or should be hypocritical. Um, Jesus should be um, 100% in line with the, the thoughts of God. Uh, and, and yet we know that's not the case, or there are apparent inconsistencies here. And so all of us, all of us heathens, who would point out, you know, Jesus instructs his disciples to go steal a donkey and, and Jesus, you know, creates a scourge, as I was talking about before, to run the moneylenders out of there. Um, there are a number of pro problems with the character of Jesus that definitely show some conflict with what God says. But Jesus's point in Matthew 15 is to um, kind of be like, before you accuse your brother uh, of having a splinter in their eye, you should take the plank out of yours. He's doing the exact same thing to the Pharisees. He's not necessarily saying, hey, anybody who stones their father or who, who uh, disrespects their father should be stoned to death. Um, he's saying, you guys don't pay attention to that part. How are you coming to criticize me and my guys for not paying attention to this other part? Which is really, the, the, the more troubling thing of it is that in, in this passage, Jesus seems to be saying, yeah, we don't need to pay attention to any of that crap. And that's how a good chunk of Christians get to the, uh, but that's the Old Testament stuff where they just get to ignore it. Well, um, I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, for God said, whoever curses father and mother should be put to death. That's not, okay, I mean, I, I hear what you said, but uh, if, if you know, Christians will latch on to other things that Jesus said, and here he's saying that God commanded anyone who curses father and mother should be put to death. I'm not that Christians should do it. I'm just saying I think that's a horrible command, and he might have been doing what you said too, but anyway. Well, okay. the thing is, if that command, in fact, came from God, yeah. it, then, it, then if Jesus is God, then it also came from him. Uh, right. And so the command exists in the Old Testament. Um, right. You don't need to go to Matthew and say, hey, look, Jesus is reinforcing it. Jesus already, um, about 10 chapters before this, I think, said not a jot or tittle of the law will change until all has come to pass. And this is why when Jesus is saying, keep the commandments, and then somebody comes up and is like, hey, which, which commandments? Which is the greatest commandment? You know, what, what should we do? Jesus is giving answers. You know, he, he was basically killed for putting himself co-equal with God and making proclamations about, uh, from the standpoint of God, because Jesus is presenting himself as God incarnate. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Before Abraham was, I am. All of these things are the reasons that Jesus... So it's not surprising when you look at uh, Matthew 15, 4, where Jesus is reinforcing or using... Um, as a tool, the Old Testament passage about stoning unruly children, we didn't, it didn't matter. If Jesus never mentioned it, as long as Jesus didn't correct it, that Old Testament passage is still as problematic as it ever was. Just like Jesus didn't correct or change anything about slavery. So all of those Old Testament passages, I don't know what grounds anybody dismisses them. Uh, if you have a, a board game and you have a set of rules, specific rules override general rules, and new rules override old rules. So when you have a board game that releases an addendum, like, oh, I don't know, a New Testament of instructions, the New Testament one would supersede, but only if it's specifically there. Jesus could have showed up on day one and said, hey, here's all the things in scripture that are wrong, except there wasn't a codified scripture that he could really reference. So all he can do is reference the teaching uh, you know, of this and this and reference what ancient scribes wrote and things like that. Anyway, he it's, did it's know what the scripture was going to be. So he could have still said that. <laughs> yes, it, that would have been great too. You know, instead of in, in going to, you know, Timothy, where Paul's saying that um, all scripture is God, God breathed and useful for instruction. Jesus could have come along and said, uh, someday there'll be a collection of scripture and it'll still include things that are wrong. Here are the things that are right. And you take those things as the, as the update, and Jesus could have updated all of them. 
but he didn't. He could have also said them in every language so that there was never any translation errors. That would have also been yeah. perfectly possible and within the realms of plausibility, but didn't do that either. So good stuff. Well done, God. Anyway, yeah, there, there are videos yeah. coming Art, on that, but I'm not going to go okay. into it anymore on today. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, cheers. Thank well, you. I guess my, my closing thought would be, why would we take advice on how to treat your father from someone who is their own father? Or why would we take advice on how to treat your mother from someone who allegedly impregnated his own mother with himself? Seems like yeah. he is the least of all relevant people to take advice <laughs> from. So as a completely pointless comment, I just wanted to make a snide jab. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Art. All right. Um, ooh. Well, we we have someone calling in to specifically criticize me, so maybe I, maybe Katie can fix it. Um, Dan in Texas is a panentheist, uh, pronouns are he him, and um, thinks that I'm dismissive when it comes to what, Dan. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we we welcome you to the show, and I'm asking you what you thought I was too dismissive of. Yeah. So didn't, maybe didn't make it into the screen caller. Before I say that, let me say I've listened to you on and off for years. First time calling in, and I'm very excited to talk with you. I remember vaguely, and you can correct me if this is not true today. You saying that there's no benefit the spirituality or religion can offer that couldn't be had without adopting these beliefs. And I wanted to push back on that. Is that, is that, a, is that a statement that you would still uh, agree with? That's not quite an accurate representation of what I said. Um, I wasn't asserting that there aren't benefits. I was repeatedly asking people to provide an example of a real and true benefit that can only be achieved if the particular supernatural beliefs are in fact true. Um, I, I've pointed out many different times that, um, for example, prayer can work, not in the way that people describe it, but if I'm trapped in a mine and it's closed in and my oxygen is limited, and I start to pray, if I sincerely believe that my prayer is reaching um, a God and increasing my chances of survival, then that can have the effect of calming me down so that I use less oxygen, which increases the amount of time I'm there, which increases the chance that I'm being, uh, that I'm likely to be rescued. But there's no evidence that the prayer itself is being answered by a supernatural being. So, it's not that I'm saying, hey, there's no benefit to any of this. It is, show me a real and true benefit that is tied to the truth of the belief. Yeah, I would totally agree with that analogy. And I don't know if I disagree with it. I don't know that there is necessarily something that is attached to the truth of it. But the question cool. is, am I more... Excellent, next like, cool. And, and again, I'm, I'm saying this... I'm, <laughs> I'm saying this as from my experience. Obviously, if you did experience, it'd be different. But I know for me, I've made, I found it much a much easier on ramp to affirmative prayer, to getting into a, a flow state, to just having an organic sense of optimism when I attach that or or build that inside of a belief that there is a transcendent realm, there is a a a, a existence, a dimension, whatever word you want to use, and I'm being deliberately vague because I couldn't define these in a very uh, specific way. But like that belief allows me to on-ramp into these benefits. Now, could you experience benefits without the belief? Of course. Uh, but I think for, for me, and I, I would imagine this is true with a lot of other people, there is a increased ability for them to access this more enlightened state, this more connected sense of self, if they nest that in this belief, right? Now, maybe they can yeah. maybe they can get to the point where they don't need that belief, and that's awesome. But I think it's, for a lot of people, it's very beneficial in that way. And I, I don't know so if they would if be able you, to get it without that. If you can achieve the same things with or without the belief, and also regardless of whether it's true or not, um, I guess it's, you know, exactly like what Matt just described in the mine, where 
maybe it makes things easier for you to believe in that one thing but also someone else might believe in something that's mutually exclusive and achieve the same benefit kind of i mean fine but that doesn't really explain to us what is true or not or yeah. why we should do it or what you're you know, describing it, it anything other than what's just in your mind what you're describing is dumbo's magic feather you're saying Ah, it's much easier for me to fly if I think that I have a magic feather. And then you extend this to there are people out there who are going to find it much easier to reach certain conclusions or make their way through life if they have these beliefs, whether they're true or not. And I find that to be infantilizing, arrogant, and insulting because what would be much more productive would be to find out what actual real things are happening that provide the benefit and then skipping the window dressing and the magic feather and going directly to those. So that if I'm trapped in a, in a mind fall in, instead of praying, um, I just say, ah, I need to conserve oxygen. And this, and knowing this, I mean, that's, that's all that it needs. So what, and, and I don't think that I'm not, I know Dan, I'm not, not trying to say you're trying to be insulting to everybody, but I, I just find this concept of, well, some people can do it without God, but some people need God. Uh, I, I find that demeaning because I'm not convinced it's true. It may be true that there's somebody out there that's only going to be a good person if they believe there's a God that's going to punish them or a person that's only going to care about others because they think there's some reward for it. But I, I generally have a higher view of humanity than that, a more respectful view, where I think that the overwhelming majority of people can learn to exercise empathy even if they, we, we know there are people who don't have a good handle on empathy, but can understand it at a, at a cognitive level so that this can change the way they're behaving. And I, I think if we taught people more accurately the facts of reality, I don't know what we would lose. Actually, what, I, think I, I think I addressed this with, with Jordan Peterson, which is if we removed religion, um, what would we lose? If we removed supernatural beliefs, what would we lose apart from the beliefs? What, what true and good thing goes away? And it, since you're acknowledging that people can uh, reach those goals through purely secular means or through just embracing reality, then it seems like what we need to do is come up with a better way of teaching the skills that those people have developed or can develop to the people who haven't developed those skills yet. Why wouldn't that be the preferred path? I think that might be in a lot of cases, and I'm, I'm reading some of the comments as, as you're talking here. The, oh, someone was saying uh, meditation, <laughs> meditation, and I, I would agree. I would say that the vast majority of my positive experiences have been in the context of meditation. But I, I think if I wanted to address this in a more direct sense, I would, I would view spirituality as a coping mechanism, similar to the coping mechanisms of humor or suppression, altruism, sublimation, a coping mechanism is a, is a tool, a technique you use to get through a particularly disturbing emotional time in your life to help you navigate when maybe your rationality isn't what it should be. And if you had a sense of equanimity and sense of balance and sense of perspective, eventually you might outgrow the need for these coping mechanisms. Maybe you don't need to use humor to soften the blow of something. Maybe you don't need to use altruism to find a sense of purpose in your life. But just, just that doesn't make these, these things bad. We all need coping mechanisms here and there. Now, again, hopefully everyone is progressing and getting the mental health care they need and the, the support they need so they, they don't have to like be relying on it 24 yeah. seven. But I look at it's it's reality as a similar thing. It's a coping mechanism that can be very helpful. Go ahead. Hang, yeah, hang sorry on, to just cut in. Again. Just um, so, like, I agree that just because something's a coping mechanism, that doesn't mean it's bad. But also, that doesn't mean it's not bad. Like, there are some coping mechanisms which are bad in quite obvious ways, like drug addiction, which is often a coping mechanism and often makes people's life even worse. Um, so oh, yeah. we could. It, the first thing we do, if we acknowledge that believing in something which may or may not be true is a coping mechanism, we need to decide if it is good or bad. Because, you know, maybe we can say, oh, it, it aids you to get to some state quicker. But also, again, so might some very addictive drugs might also aid you to get there. So then we need to ask what, what, 
are the like pros and cons of believing in something which you can't know to be true. And one of the obvious cons I would say is if you're already believing in one thing that you have no evidence for, what is to stop you from believing in other things you have no evidence for? And then you might come to conclusions or make decisions based on that, which potentially harm people. Um, that's quite an abstract statement, but I, you know, personally see that all the time from people uh, as someone who is an LGBT person. So, you know, people believe things that they have absolutely no evidence for about us and ma make decisions based upon that. <clears throat> and quite often, the I, when you confront them and you say this is like a blind faith position, they don't see anything wrong with the idea of blind faith because it's already a fundamental, like, um, characteristic of their worldview. So, like, blind faith is a core component of their life. Whereas someone who doesn't have any blind faith could still easily be doing the exact same things. You know, I still meet atheist and secular and people so like even people claiming to be skeptics who are anti-LGBT, but at least theoretically, the fact that they don't. Uh, acknowledge the fact that blind belief is a good way of finding out whether something is true or not, then you can convince them by saying, you have no evidence for this. In practice, that doesn't always work. <laughs> but at least um, acknowledging the fact that something doesn't have any evidence and isn't necessarily good or bad, um, that's a good start to... Uh, you know, if you don't have evidence for something and someone doesn't think blind faith is a good reason, then that's a good start to changing their mind. Do you see where I'm coming from on that? Yeah, I would agree with I would agree with almost everything you said there. I think the only thing that I would say is that for me, my belief that I have in what I like to call transcendence, but other people might have other words for it, it's not about truth. And to me, truth is really important, but it's not the only thing. It's, it, there's, there's, there's things that I can, there's empowerment I can access in life. Whether or not something's true, I can still be empowered by that. Now, I think, to your point, can these things harm? If you have uh, beliefs and they're, they promote negative stereotypes of certain groups of people, or they promote a judgment of other people that don't agree with you, or you do things differently. I would say yes. Uh, I, for me, a higher empowering belief, I could, I, I could say it would, it would be do no harm. And so if someone was to show me that, oh, this belief is leading to X, Y, Z, in, in my case, I would say, okay, that, that's a belief I need to change then. That's a belief I need to discard because I do not want to cause harm. That, that's, a, that's a more empowering belief to me than whatever spiritual beliefs I have. So I, I don't think, now, I, I think that could be a valid concern if people are taking their beliefs and then saying, I'm going to enact policy that's going to harm people, that, that is going to be restrict other people's freedoms based upon my interpretation of my religion. But again, that's not a, that's not a tactic that I am doing. My tactic is yeah, I'm, simply... I'm, of course not accusing you of that. This, this is I guess, for me, and it, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not in any way harmful that I can see. To maybe understand what, as an example of what you're saying, maybe not the exact same thing, but you know, you're saying you can get some kind of empowerment out of something which may or may not be true. Would you say an example of that would be someone who's like uh, a sports player of some kind, and they they're like, "I'm the best," and they believe, you know, maybe genuinely believe they're the best at this sport, and that hypes them up enough to perform their best at the sport. Is that like an example? Yeah, that could be that, that could be a, a good analogy. Yeah, and so that so belief that is empowering and helpful to them. Even if it d turns out not to be true, it's still helpful and it was useful for them. But it's, it, I mean, I guess this is one of these things, and I don't really want to go into my own analogy so much, but at least in that context, you could see why it could be helpful and it could be harmful. Because someone who believes they're the best sure might feel less anxious and anxiety can affect your performance in lots of things. And it might take away self-doubt and make them make quicker decisions and all this kind of stuff. But it could also um, make them feel like they don't have uh, any weak points or that they are better than someone and cause them to underestimate their opponent. Uh, it could cause rash decision making where they don't doubt themselves enough. So I guess um, maybe this is just confined to well, sport and, that, and you don't think that's true for the general case. 
But like, it does feel like no, I think that's if you believe in something that could potentially be false, it could like strengthen some properties that you have, but you don't really know which ones uh, they're going to be, and it's hard to measure those things. And you might be overlooking the negatives. You think? Yeah, I, I would. Yeah. I would agree with almost all of that. I think what I would say is, I, I'm I'm trying to the best of my ability constantly monitor my beliefs and say, is this belief a net empowerment or is it a net limitation? Right. Ah, and, see, yeah, that's any the, belief, this is the problem. And, and any belief can, can come to the point where oh, it was empowering previously. Now it's limiting, so I need to just discard it. And so this, my life is very evolved on what is the most empowering beliefs. And if it's more empowering than limiting, well, why wouldn't I choose that? It's, it's, it's providing more empowerment because, than it is limitations to my life. So that's like a valid belief. So the reason to not choose it is because it's not true. See, you're you're just you're sitting here saying, "Oh, I just look at beliefs to see which ones are more empowering than not." Well, I don't give a shit if it's more empowering. I give a shit if it's true. And you're sitting here saying, "Oh, it's not harmful in any way that I can see." Well, whether or not you can see it doesn't change whether it's harmful. If you had a calculator that one percent of the time gave a wrong answer, but you didn't have any way of knowing it, is that okay? No, but that presumes that objective knowledge of truth is possible. No, it presumes uh, that there's right fucking answer and the calculator gets it wrong and you don't have the ability to determine it. See, the thing is with beliefs and you, and you prioritizing what's empowering and not caring about whether or not it's true means that you're willing to accept that something is true when you acknowledge that you don't have sufficient reason to think it's true. You have reasons to think that it may be false, but if as long as it's not identifiably harmful, you're going to keep going, which means your criteria for belief is about what you like and what you find beneficial, not what is true. Now, if in fact you believe something and you can't see what the harm is in it, but you believe it and it turns out that it's not true, then what you have is a flawed heuristic in your brain. Your brain now for at least one category and beliefs don't live in a vacuum. And so it's probably the case for other things, your brain is misfunctioning, malfunctioning, and will accept something as true as not. I'm gonna. If, can, I don't know if can you see the screen. Yeah, I can see that. Yes, I can I see know, can, all, but I have you muted on the screen, so it's not just, too. I just put up. Off. I just put up a graphic over my face because somebody Good. recently died, <laughs> and in a support group for them, there was a picture of people working around, and there was one of these little orbs um in the in the picture now we know from study that these orbs that appear are almost always particles of dust that are refracting light and the has to do with the way lenses work but there's a group of people who've not only think that they are communications from ghosts but have identified them by the color and so it, it, when they see an orb and an image, they're convinced that, oh, this one is communication and clarity. This one is intuition. And I got into an argument with one of those people. Well, not really. I, I pointed out to them, um, th they were saying that basically it's whatever people believe, that's what's true. And I'm like, no, that's not how truth works. So the fact that you don't see what the harm is, um, what if you are incapable of seeing the harm and yet there's still harm? Instead of having a burden of proof that says, I'm just going to believe what I want and what I feel is beneficial until somebody shows me where the harm is, why not recognize that there's intrinsic harm in shifting the burden of proof in such a way that your brain accepts things irrespective of whether or not they're true based on your desire? That is a problem. And that is a problem that carries on to other beliefs that, you, that, that could be more harmful. Can I, can there be a hidden problem with a belief? Sure. But the fact that, I mean, I feel like that's true with any belief. There's always a possible hidden downside to a belief that you don't know of. And if you discover yeah. that and hopefully you change the belief or mitigate the downside, I, I think the only thing I'll say, and this might be, but this you might change be, it with uh, evidence, uh, don't you? Good. Like, Dan, so sorry, Dan, to cut you off again, but like, when you, okay. you know, you were talking about net positive and net negative, but in order to evaluate that, you have to look at the evidence and see how your belief has caused real things. And 
looking at the evidence is like what Matt's talking about. It's the core part of this. In order to decide what's good or bad, we look at the evidence and we reason based on that. But you're saying, well, I also look at stuff that has no evidence. So you're less capable of reasoning which is good and which is bad. Because there might be, you know, maybe a, a part of your belief is this belief in transcendence or maybe in some kind of afterlife or something like that. And you know, I would say that telling people, telling you know, if you believe in an afterlife, you might think that telling other people about this afterlife is a good thing because then it makes them happier. But I might think it's a bad thing because you're telling these people that it doesn't really matter if they make huge big mistakes in their one and only life because they'll get another one. So then they're more likely to do stupid and bad things and waste their life like, you know, just in some crazy way. Um, and to you, that wouldn't seem harmful because you're like, well, there, I already believe in the afterlife. So my way of evaluating whether my action of telling people about the afterlife like, is based upon no evidence. It's based upon the belief already. So I'm evaluating this as good. Whereas I'm saying, because there's no evidence for that, the evaluation of the same action, from my point of view, based purely on evidence, is bad. So maybe even your ability to you, decide what is net negative and positive is itself like a, a flaw, a product of that system. Yeah, I would, I would tend to agree with your characterization of the afterlife, people having this sense where, well, it doesn't really matter. And it's because of that very reason I don't have a traditional view of the afterlife like that, because I, I recognize and I would agree with that. Yeah, so I, I kind of feel I, the only last thing I want to say because this is kind of uh, unless you want to keep talking, I can keep talking. But uh, Matt, no, we got other callers too, but and we hit a lot. Okay, and I, I guess, and I, I don't want this to devolve into just a philosophical debate, but you know, truth I would say fundamentally is based upon a called an assumption, call it a connection between our perception. Our perception of reality and what we believe reality to be. So, if you, I mean, if you go back to Descartes, uh, the only thing that I can really, for sure, say is true is that I'm, while I'm perceiving, that a perceiving thing exists. Right? Anything beyond that is something that I'm making an assumption about. I mean, it's an assumption. I have a body. I'm making an assumption, and that doesn't mean these things aren't true. At least in a sense of me using them to navigate life and using them as a reliable metric. But I, I, the, the reason I'm saying that is because sometimes you talk about truth as this as objective thing that just exists. But no, I think truth is in, in, inexplicably connected to perception. It, like we, we can't escape perception in our understanding and delineation of what truth is. No, Dan, no, Dan, you don't get to say, so yes, whether or not we have access to truth is independent from whether or not truth exists there is in fact a right fucking answer to a question whether you know it or not and for after i've pointed out that your criteria by the way has nothing to do with whether or not the claim is true and everything to do with whether or not you find the truth use or the the belief useful you don't get to then come in and lecture about how, well, maybe we don't have access to truth because you're no longer talking about truth. You're talking about our access to truth. And here's the thing. If you have a belief that you find useful and you don't see what the harm is in it, but you acknowledge you have no way to demonstrate it's true, and want, how can you possibly believe that it's true? If you have no way to demonstrate that it's true, how can you possibly believe it's true? That is, by definition, irrational. You can believe it's useful all you want, but you don't get to believe it's true and claim to be rational if you're acknowledging that there's no way for you to demonstrate that it's true. We're not throwing truth under the bus. Whether or not you and I ever have access to what the truth is on any specific question is irrelevant to whether or not we are warranted in believing a particular proposition because evidential warrant for a proposition may not have anything to do with truth and that's where you get into our perception of it but to believe things based on a foundational criteria of does this benefit me 
instead of a foundational criteria of, do I have evidentiary warrant to reasonably accept that this is likely true, is a fundamentally flawed epistemology. It's the, it's, it is the, the, the very impl, impl, uh, blah, 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 is a very instantiation of self-deception, that you're going to believe that something is probably true because you find it personally beneficial, not because there's evidence to suggest that it's probably true. Your positions should be, your, your confidence in a position should be proportional to the evidence, not proportional to your benefit or desire from it. I, I would agree that my confidence is proportional to the evidence. That's true. So like if you were to ask me, is my belief in transcendence greater or less than my belief in the theory of evolution? I would say no question. Theory of evolution is much higher confidence in that than belief in transcendence. But if I your belief in that... transcendence, is your belief in transcendence the same but as your belief in Russell's teapot, you know, the, the magical teapot going around the moon. Because they, they both have the same amount of evidence. Not quite, because Russell's teapot... So what separates that, them? Right? Well, I feel like Russell's teapot, you're positing something that is physically present orbiting. So theoretically, well, I just something else then. Take the, the fact that there's... There. Like, you've got no well, evidence well, for... Well, lo there's loads of stuff, loads of beliefs that people have that there's no evidence for. Like the, the magical balls that Matt was talking about earlier, the orbs that communicate life after death or whatever. I need like, to understand something, though. In that. I need to so, understand yeah. what you mean by transcendence, well, because you're using transcendence as yeah, if it's a that thing that's <laughs> clearly understood. <laughs> what, what is what your transcendence trans belief? Is a very good question. I feel if I had to put in words, it would be today. that. Good question, yeah. I feel if I had to put in words, uh, it would be that there is an energy field, there is a uh, an extra dimension that is beyond, above the physical reality that we generally experience and are interacting with on a day to day basis, and that it's possible to have a sense of connection and sense of union with this energy that can promote feelings of uh, universal love and a sense of optimism that I find very difficult to access without that, uh, not, not impossible, but I think more difficult to access without that belief. Is that helpful at all? No. Mm, well, <laughs> I was gonna say no too. Energy has particular definitions. So you basically just said that your idea of transcendence is that there's something that you can't really describe, but you're going to call it an energy that helps you get access to universal love. What evidence do you have that that thing exists? Well, this is where I would go back to my experiences with optimism, my experiences with meditation, these aren't, these aren't things that, these aren't evidence in the sense of, should this Correct. matter to anyone else? No, it shouldn't. But, but it's, it's incredibly valuable to me. And Okay, hang on, that, hang on, Dan. That's how, many other, how many other claims about special types of energy that have nothing to do with science and have no evidence, how many other energy claims are you also accepting and how many other energy claims are you rejecting and what is your criteria for determining which ones you accept and which ones you reject how many others am i accepting probably not probably no others or very very few others what's my criteria for acceptance whether or not it's a net empowerment to my life yeah but there might okay. be a lot that I can, I can pack. could empower you that's all. right that you just don't know about there could, could be others other, that... other beliefs and other things that, yeah could be uh could be you're just going to try out every single belief and see if it makes you feel good uh no probably not how do we test it <laughs> how do we test a belief's truth or its empowerment how do we either. verify that well yeah either we'll go with either 
Uh, well, so empowerment, you test by your experience living with that belief and your interactions <laughs> with other people, the, the ability for you it, to function. No, no, what, and one have thing I, I don't really understand, one thing I don't really understand is, is like, I know this is kind of, might just sound like we're just going in circles, but I don't really understand how to believe things that I don't have evidence for. I mean, like, I, I used to believe in Father Christmas or Santa Claus or whatever, and I didn't ever have, like, direct physical meeting Father Christmas evidence. But I was told by people that I trusted and saw the presence, and that was enough evidence for me. And I believed it, but I don't. There's no way I could ever believe in this energy field thing that you're talking about. Like I couldn't convince myself to do it because I don't think. Well, you know, I'm not. I'm not like. I'm not trying to say your belief is the same as Father Christmas or whatever, but <laughs> I, you know, I have moved past the stage where just being told about something generally will convince me of it. I'm now at the point where I'm going to want some kind of, uh, some kind of evidence or some kind of reasoning. And you know there are loads of these different energy claims that Matt was talking about, like there are probably as many as there are people who believes in the supernatural. I just couldn't believe in any of them. Not not because I don't like people like that. Not because you know the energy claims are wacky to me. N none of that. Just because I can't choose. I don't really feel like I can choose what I believe. I believe things when I get the evidence for them. Yep. And I don't otherwise. And there are things yep. I believe which are probably false and I don't have evidence for. And as soon as someone points them yep. out, it's just going to crumble away. You know, if someone, because yeah. I used to think like, uh, you know, I used to think all kinds of stupid things like gay people are all horrible people or whatever. And someone's like, that's bullshit. You don't have any evidence for that. <clears throat> and then now I don't believe that anymore. Yeah. Y yeah. You're basically... I do believe that there are definitely. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying, basically, Dan, I, I'm, I'm stuck at this. I care about whether or not beliefs are true and whether or not, and, and by true, um, I don't necessarily claim that we have access to truth. What I care is whether or not they, they are reasonably supported by evidence. So I want a good standard of evidence so that I have as many true beliefs and as few false beliefs as possible. This is the foundation of skepticism, of scientific in inquiry. And so when somebody comes to me and says, ooh, there's a higher power, Okay, I first of all, I need to know what you mean by a higher power, um, because language like that we frequently toss around with the assumption that everybody understands what we mean, and because of that, nobody ever defines what it means. Oh, there's a higher energy, there's a higher consciousness, there's a higher thing. To me, that's all sophistry and deepities, uh, and I, I genuinely, and so when I ask people, hey, What's the reason for believing it? In your case, Dan, which, you know, credit you for acknowledging it and just being honest about it. In your case, Dan, it seems to be, I don't see any way to demonstrate that it's true, but I like it and I think I benefit from it. So I'm gonna go with it until somebody shows me why it's harmful. The problem is, is that I think we kind of did show you why believing something without evidentiary warrant is harmful because your, 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 your brain uses every other thing you believe as a heuristic to address new claims, claims that you can't accept. If you were to accept every single claim that you can't prove, but that you feel benefits you, wouldn't you be in a position where you would have to be accept accepting things that are mutually exclusive? Wouldn't, you would have to be accepting two things, one of which must be false. Well, not if, I mean, my, the most empowering belief for me is the belief in non-contradiction. To, to me, like that, if something <laughs> violates that, it's by definition unempowering because now I'm forced to believe in contradictions. So I think if, if uh, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Can Couldn't I comment you, on something I that- I don't see why you couldn't be empowered by believing in contradictions. Like all of the, all of the, like people that I talk to on the internet every single day for my sins, uh, they, they love- <laughs> believing in contradictions and it like really does empower them to make any argument they like and it empowers them to not change their mind and to be confident in things which are trivially false um and and it, it like empowerment obviously has lots of different meanings but part of the reason that a lot of the people who come at me and say stupid things do what they do is because it makes them feel powerful like empowered 
in their case, talking down to someone who they think they're better than. I'm not saying you're doing that, but like they are empowered right. in in multiple senses by a belief in contradictions or by having no issue with having contradictory beliefs. Like some of them will just straight up just own it. They'll just say A equals not A, and that is why you should be banned from society. And they don't seem to care at all. And it's it's given them the time of their life. You know, that's that's their hobby in some cases. So they, why why they, does it empower you more? Like how do we know? Have you tried believing in contradictions? They, they feel they well, I've tried. It hasn't worked too well. <laughs> they, they they feel a thrill in the moment of stating things or believing things that are contradictory and using that as a weapon possibly. I, I would question though whether that really empowers them in their life going forward. Again, I can't answer that. They'd have to decide that for themselves. Ah, but it's an interesting think, argument though. It makes you feel good in the moment, but it's not necessarily good for your long term because that's kind of our argument against believing in things without evidence. It makes you feel good in the moment, but in the long term, believing in things without evidence is bad for you and the others around uh, you. Yeah, I don't. I guess. I guess I. I wouldn't agree as long as you're prioritizing scientific truth and logic above that. Yeah, it becomes a problem if you're. <laughs> but you're prioritizing you're those things. In... You're prioritizing what you find beneficial. That's not prioritizing scientific proof or logic. You are dismissing sure good I'll evidentiary I'll standards. To be the most beneficial thing. Sorry, go ahead. You you are dismissing the best epistemological standards and replacing it with because it feels good. I don't think that you can get away from choosing epistemology based upon what you think allows you to function best in the world. Why do I believe in the law of non contradiction? Well, because if I don't believe that, I'm going to have some really difficult times operating in the world. Why do I believe in the consensus of scientists about a particular topic and uh, tend to take a uh, consensus peer reviewed article as the truth on any claim? Me. Because it, 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 to me, it's, it's the most reliable method that uh, of showing something to be accurate and repeatable and testable. And I, I, I don't think I don't think that there's a different happen. metric here. Uh, this is this is this is uh, it's 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 uh, hierarchical in the sense that if you're to show me, if you're to show me some way in which my beliefs about transcendence or um, any of the different nested things under that by it, what was like saying oh well this uh, no, scientific consensus no, here Dan, shows no, it to be true Dan, I'm like, okay Dan, yeah, then, then I have to no, change that or, or log Dan yeah. Dan no I've absolutely hit my limit for bullshit in one call um, if you have a if you have an epistemology where you're like, oh, I'm going to go with science and I'm going to avoid logic. And uh, then you can't believe the energy transcendent bullshit that you're advocating for because it's not supported by science. You've already acknowledged that your, your foundation is about whether or not you find it beneficial, not whether or not you find it true, and that you've shifted the burden of proof such that you will keep believing something until somebody shows you the harm while you ignore the harm of what is demonstrably a a flawed heuristic or a flawed epistemology that will necessarily lead you to believe two things that are in contradiction. Because if you have no way to demonstrate that, that something is most likely the case, and there are two things that you have no way to demonstrate there's most likely the case, you have nothing beyond whichever feels good to you to go with. And whatever feels good to you is not in any way a reliable path to a correct position. I have to move on. I, I have run out of times repeating myself in one call. It is, in fact, mutually exclusive, like science and using the scientific method to make models and make predictions is mutually exclusive with doing what feels right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm happy but to move on. Thank you. Thanks for the call, Dan. <laughs> and we can go over some other stuff another time, perhaps. But yeah, I'm just. I, I genuinely don't understand an epistemology that just encourages people to go with what whatever they think is beneficial. Because um, you could be wrong about what's beneficial and what's beneficial to you in the short term may turn out to be wrong in the in the long term. Um, it's incredibly beneficial to slave owners to have slaves do the work for them. Um, 
But uh, that doesn't mean it's beneficial to the slaves and it doesn't mean it's beneficial to society. And right up until the time that there's actual evidence to consider to show why your belief's wrong, you would be sitting there saying, yeah, but it feels good to me and I can't do that, nor can I support it. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Bye. I'm always really confused <sighs> by these energy, like higher energy claims, because I, I know that when they say energy, they're just generally just trying to pick a word that sounds like something we know exists, but we can't see. But it also, it's hard not to like ask, like take energy is literally what energy means, because like, we can measure how much energy is in the universe and they make predictions on how much energy is in the universe. And that's why we've come up with a concept of dark energy, because the galaxies are moving away from each other faster than they should do with how much energy we think is in the, like we can measure in the universe and we can predict there should be more. So we know there is more energy that we can't detect. So there is energy out there that we can't detect, but if there was more on top of that, because like dark energy obviously isn't what they're talking about, then we should be able to detect it. So yeah, this is like, oh, it, or predict there's it. another dimension. There's another dimension and there's an energy, but it's not detectable. It's not measurable. It's not identifiable. Uh, okay. Then, then what's your justification for calling it energy? Well, uh, it, it seems to feel like energy to me. Sounds cool. Okay. Yeah. It, it's like people don't understand what energy is. And so, oh, if I was thinking about something and I got chills, maybe that's energy. Maybe energy is what makes my hair stand up. Maybe energy is what gives me the butterflies. Um, yeah and you technically you know, you true to, <laughs> and, and yes it is uh it's just that that's not a special higher level extra dimension energy but before we get on to the next few calls uh let me go ahead and make some of the announcements again so first of all a huge thank you to everybody who's called in today uh great calls great discussions and and uh, where the hell you been katie it's been like years and and we're having all kinds of fun on the show uh we'll have yeah. to do more sunday shows That's when we can back. But um, tomorrow on Skeptalk, Shannon Q will be with uh, Maya Adkison. That is a show that is primarily focused on, I don't know, you could call in about energy things and higher dimension things, but uh, it, it is not necessarily focused on theism or political views. Wednesday, I'll be back with The Hang Up, uh, and I'll be joined by uh, Dara the, who oh, is it, Dara or Dara? I'm going to go with Dara. Uh, the Magic Skeptic. Thursday on Tacus will be Arden and Luxander, uh, the Transatlantic Call In Show. I, sh I should stop saying Tacus because we need people. It's the Transatlantic no Call In Show. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like on Thursday, it's the energy show with Arden and Luxander. Um, <laughs> Friday, we're expecting an episode of Hostility, uh, hosted by John Gleason with guest Rebecca Vitzman. Uh, a huge thank you to our call screener today, Dragon, and all of our moderators and everybody else. We we got more calls, and we're going to keep on trucking. Um, we'll see uh, here. Omar in California wants to talk to me about my inconsistency on the Bible, my logical fallacies of cherry picking, quoting out of context, and moving the goalpost. All right, that's a I'll lot, Omar. So, okay, oh, that, that's a lot, yep. Omar. So, can you give one example of where I have either cherry picked, quoted out of context, or move a goalpost so that we can address my actual claim? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking my call. So, I've called in before over the years, and it's those discussions that we have had, um, and some of the things that you have said, which um, lead me to conclude that of your logical fallacy so for example you Which made fallacy? numerous statements yeah so on slavery right and last week you took a call where you said when i called the takeaway message of the bible is to enslave people it's recorded on your show that is what yes. you said and as i tried to explain to you that there are numerous verses throughout the bible which would reject that notion that it encourages people and promotes slavery. And you weren't letting me even explain. You were muting me and asking me loaded questions. Okay, so I've muted you um, because I know how much you enjoy it. Um, here's the thing. All I was saying is that the Bible explicitly allows for slaver, slavery and never explicitly condemns slavery. Is there a verse you can point to that explicitly 
condemns slavery. Is there a verse that I can point to that explicitly rejects or discourages slavery? Is that your question? Condemns. That explicitly condemns slavery. Yes. Yeah, so there's a, there, there's a couple of verses. So Exodus 21, 16. Whoever, Exodus Ready. 21, 16. Who, okay. Hello? Can you that, hear me? You're yes. talking over so, me. Yeah, we can hear you. I am talking over you um, because Exodus 21.16 doesn't mention slavery. Exodus 21.16 is about stealing people. Okay. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Deuteronomy yes. 23.15 through I'm 16. sorry, but I'm going to mute you again because you don't seem to understand how the conversation goes on. As I pointed out, Exodus 21, verse 16, does not mention slavery and does not condemn slavery. I asked for verses that explicitly condemn slavery. That verse does not condemn slavery. It doesn't say that slavery is wrong. It doesn't say the institution is wrong. It doesn't say that there's anything at all wrong with owning people as property. What it says is, if you steal someone and sell them, that's not what slavery is. Slavery is not stealing someone and selling them necessarily. Slavery is owning another person as property, which the Bible explicitly allows, that you can buy your slaves from the heathen that surround you, that they become your property, that you can beat and pass on to your children. Exodus 21.16 does not mention slavery directly or indirectly. And the very notion that you could steal a person reinforces the concept that people can be viewed as property, which could be stolen as well. So do you have another verse that you can use to say this other verse explicitly condemns slavery? So sometimes I, I, I debate Muslims and your, your answer reminded me of when a Muslim asked me, show me. Okay. I'm going to mute you again because I don't give a <laughs> flying fuck about your debates with Muslim or anything else, you are calling in to say that I'm wrong. And every single time we give you the opportunity to suggest that I'm wrong, you further show that I am correct and you are incorrect. And so I'm asking you, since your first attempt of Exodus 21.16 fails to explicitly condemn slavery, do you have another verse that you can point to that explicitly condemns slavery? We already know the answer is you no. You, you must not return an escaped slave to his master when he has run away to you. Indeed, he may live among you in any place. Yeah, that also does not in any way condemn the institution of slavery. And even if you could find a verse, which you can't, because it does not exist in the Bible, that explicitly condemns slavery, now we would be in a position where one part of the Bible explicitly permits slavery, and another part of the Bible explicitly condemns slavery. So now we would be in a position where the Bible contradicts itself from one place to another, and you would need a way to resolve that. But we don't need to get to that because you can't, because there is, a, because there is no point. You won't let me talk, and you that, keep muting me. You know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to ban I'm going to ban you, Omar, because you Yeah, you should, because into I'm going to deal with you, and I'm going to expose your lies. Deal you're with. not going to expose anything. You, 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 you lied own. last week when you said you. you no, I'm muting you again. You, Omar, are a lying cartoon who thinks you can call in and take over the show. You are an obnoxious, garbage thinker that I've already rejected on numerous occasions. But I gave you yet one more chance today. I gave you one more chance. Because all of us are aware that the Bible never expressly prohibits or condemns slavery. But you and the, and the other people who are absolutely trying to redeem a garbage, disgusting book that is vile in every way, you are going to try to suggest that I've committed a logical fallacy. There is no logical fallacy. I read the fucking verses. There is no cherry picking. You're the one trying to cherry pick by saying, hey, I know this verse over here says you can own people as property, but this one over here says, if you find a runaway slave, don't return him. That has nothing to do with whether or not the Bible condemns or supports slavery. 
Uh, I'm going to return you to the queue and you can sit there on hold for the rest of the show if you want and listen to it that way. But you are done speaking on any show that I'm on anytime I know it's actually you because I don't think that you are legit or for real because you are dishonest in communication. I, I always think it's weird when people come out with this, oh, the Bible must condemn this thing. You know, here's my verse that we can interpret in a certain way. The Bible has absolutely no problems condemning certain things. Like when it wants to condemn stuff, it just does yeah. it. It says, thou shalt not, and it makes it really clear. And they come up with really harsh punishments. Like, you know, the thing we were talking about earlier, putting someone to death because they've disrespected their parents. Like it's made that, that's one of the top commandments. The do not do, you know, you've got to love God the most. It is absolutely condemning loving another God the most, just in the clearest, most explicit terms. And then suddenly it comes to owning other people. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, just don't beat them to death super quickly. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it, I guess. And oh, and if one gets away, then then don't return them. But, you know, but then also you might get accused of kidnapping. So uh, like it, it's just a cop out. Like, the, the the premise behind all of this stuff is that there is this all-knowing, all-powerful God who is capable of communicating directly to people and communicating the one true, you know, amazing truth that we should all know, and then apparently hides its condemnation to to slavery behind. It's just bullshit. Like the whole premise. It, yeah. it, People love to try and go into the weeds. And what about if we take this one interpretation of this one sentence? It's like, it would just fucking say it. If it didn't loan slavery, it would say, don't do slavery. Yeah. So hey, there's, there's the famous 10 commandments, but there's a 613 commandments for all these other things that where God supposedly gave commandments about anything and everything, shellfish, what clothing to wear. Um, and, and yet exactly. on a number of issues, where the Bible explicitly allows things like, oh, I don't know, taking multiple wives. Oh, hang on. <laughs> yeah, taking <laughs> multiple wives, of owning people as property, of beating them, where God commands the Israelites to go and slaughter people and keep the young virgin girls for themselves. Um, there's problematic passage after problematic passage where something is expressly commanded, ordered, or permitted, or where someone is rewarded and, and held up as the prophet of God, despite being a vile, disgusting individual. Like Noah, for example, who's such a terrible drunk that when one of his sons uh, sees him passed out drunk and naked, uh, Noah curses his son to be the, the servant, the slave of the other sons. The, God's gonna flood the world and kill everybody except for one family of eight, a terrible drunk who's going to curse one of his sons into being slave for the, for the other one, um, and his sons and their daughters and Noah's wife, and we're going to repopulate from that. And it's going to describe a global flood, which didn't happen, isn't possible. Um, it's a mess. And here's the thing with Omar and, and others like it, uh, others like Omar, not it, uh, others like him, is the bible says something i didn't make that up I, I can read you from exodus 21 for example the exact same one he's he went to verse 16 about man stealing but prior to that there's at beginning at the at the beginning of the chapter are all the verses about how to buy hebrew slaves and how your jewish slaves need to be treated differently than your gentile slaves that your jewish slaves you have to release them after seven years unless you trick them because um, <laughs> you want your male Jewish slaves have to be let go after seven years unless they go before the elders and say, I love my master, I want to be his slave forever. Well, who would do that? Ah, it's because if you give your slave a wife and they have kids, the wife never goes free and the kids never go free. And so, this person who served you as a slave for seven years, a servant for seven years, an indentured servitude or slavery, however you want to look at it, has to then decide, hmm, do I leave my wife and children there as slaves or do I stay? And if I stay, what happens? It's not, 
you stay until your wife and kids go free. No, it's you've decided to stay. They pierce your ear. Uh, it sounds gruesome. It's like, we're going to drive an awl through your ear into the, the wood of the door frame. It just means you pierces your ear to show that, that you're, you know, property. And now you are slaves to that person forever, despite the fact that you're a Jew. And doesn't matter whether your wife and kids die. And now you'd like to go free again. Too late. The Bible is a cartoonish pre-kindergarten understanding of ethics and morality. It is not a good book. And when people like Omar call in a bit, well, you have logical fallacies in cherry picking. No, there's no logical fallacy or cherry picking. I produced a 30 minute video, which is still out there on YouTube with probably hundreds of thousands of views, going through everything that's said in Exodus, in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy about slavery. It is a robust thing that goes through everything that's said. And when the Christians call in to say, you're ignoring this verse about man stealing, man stealing isn't slavery. Well, you're ignoring this verse about whether or not you should return slaves. That does not condemn slavery. You act like it was too difficult for God to say, thou shalt not own another human as property. I am more moral than your God. I am 10 miles smarter than your fucking God. And I am 500 miles more moral than your God. Take your garbage book and stop defending it and throw it in the trash. But don't call and pretend like you caught me in a logical fallacy when you are making shit up in order to try to redeem the disgusting features of your book. And in fact, if you're calling in to defend God saying slavery is okay and come up with rules, you are also more moral than your own God because you know yeah. that slavery is wrong and God does yeah. not. All right. We, uh, for some reason... Uh, so I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. Is it, is it Collier? Yes, Collier. Hey, Collier, pronouns of they, them calling from New York um, with a question for help. And as a reminder, lines are open right now. If you're a theist uh, and you have, if you and you know a verse in the Bible that actually condemns slavery ex explicitly, you can call 720-619-2288 or use the web link below. But if you have a better way to defend your God beliefs or a way to try to redeem your holy book, by all means, you can call in and do that too. Collier, thank you so much for waiting. You've been on hold for like two hours. I'm going to shut up now until I have something to contribute to helping you with your question. Oh, gee. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Katie, too. Uh, so my question is this. Please help me because I am doubting and I'm doubting my position and my, stand, my atheistic stance with don't understand how I can say even say that I'm doubting it because I thought that it was based on logic and reason and I don't understand how I can say that I'm doubting something if it's based out of logic and reason because that sounds contradictory to me. What's well, causing you to doubt atheism? Yeah, yeah. like I'll because like, like what would cause me <laughs> Sorry, what would cause me to like doubt atheism, which I guess is kind of a double negative, would be some kind of evidence for a god. Because for me, and I think for Matt too, and for most atheists, or many atheists, what an a being an atheist is, or what accepting atheism is, is just people are saying, I've got, I think there are gods, I think this god is real, and you just don't have any evidence for it, so you just don't believe them. So for me to doubt that position, I would have to be seeing some evidence. Are you seeing some to, evidence for to, God? Or? I have to interrupt, Katie, and I apologize. Um, th there, there's something about this you don't know. Collier, I have an important question. Why do you give a different name every time you call? Oh, I explain uh, that to uh, one of your call screeners, and he, uh, I I only give a different name because I bear the same name as my father, my biological father, and he did some not nice things to me, and uh, it's uncomfortable. That's all. Yeah, but you've you every every time you've called in, it's been a different name, a different topic. So, do you understand how it's very frustrating to take someone seriously? when they're calling in repeatedly with difficulties that don't seem to match up and names that don't match up. Hmm. 
No, I can understand that that could be problematic. Yeah, I guess you know if you'd like me to go with it with it with one name any time that I call, I could do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's I'm sorry, let's, or my let's actual deal, given let's name. Deal, let's deal with K. I don't know. It doesn't matter what name it is. It's just it, it, prank callers are the ones that use a different name every time they call in because they think we're too stupid to figure it out. But I can actually see your phone number. I can see what IP address no, people are coming calling in from. I know. So we, we know what's going on. So let's let's address Katie's question here, because when you say you're questioning your position on atheism, um, first, I guess, what is your position on atheism and what's causing you to question it? Okay, my position on atheism is that I'm not convinced there is a God. I don't see any, any evidence there is a God. I cool. did. So get, it's causing you I to did. doubt that. If the, if your position on atheism is that you don't see evidence for a god, then the only thing that could cause you to doubt that would be evidence for a god, right? Mm hmm. I'm getting so, like every time, every it seems like every time I go to a friend of mine that is Christian, they seem to have just the right words or the right scripture to give me at that time that like that I was thinking about even right before they said it. Like this morning, I went to an online Zoom ch Zoom church service, Zoom meeting, you know? And right before they gave the scripture that they were going to be teaching on them this morning, it was like that was the exact scripture that I was hoping they'd be teaching on, and those were that really? was the exact thing. There was yeah, there was not the well, not that exact scripture, uh, but that scripture was saying well, you, the exact no, thing no, no, that no. I wanted to hear. You said you said that exact scripture, and then you said not that exact scripture. Right, so what I is know, it? I know. They, I, backed, I had to back on, up. Which stop, is stop, stop. What is it you were wanting to hear, and what did you hear? I was wanting to hear something along the lines of like um, that God is with you, that He indwells in you, that oh you know that God. He's there. Collier, what are the odds that you would hear God is with you and God loves you and God would want you to know you're there or whatever it is? Isn't that the the, that isn't that the primary fucking message that you're going to hear almost every fucking time you're ever in a fucking church? Yeah, I guess so. Unless, yeah. I mean, unless you're going Imagine, to the church. Yeah. How, how silly would it be for me to say, you know what? I really want a bad hot dog and some terrible shoes. So I'm going to go to a bowling alley and wow, miracle of miracles. They had exactly <laughs> what I was looking for. <laughs> What we, you could, what we could do is we could do a test and you could think of a really rare Bible passage, like just pick one at random, or you could think of some problem in your life that's not some general, like whether God is like super hyper specific, like should you get toothpaste while it's on discount or something like that and see if that comes up in the sermon. And if it does one time, then you know it could be a fluke. So try and get like ten in a row or something, and maybe I mean even then, th who knows? But it, then you could call in and you could be like, I wrote down in advance in this sealed envelope, <laughs> ten really specific <laughs> things I wanted God to communicate with me, because then then it might be some form like there's some kind of evidence. But like Matt's saying, you know, this kind of general, you went to a church and they said God loves you and that's what you wanted to hear, and that's causing you to think there's evidence for god it just seems very like and it it wasn't even like evidence it was like my connection my connection to god i've never even had faith i've always got it done on hope like i've never even said anything that i've ever why would had you hope never god even... is real though why would you hope god is real when like the christian god is horrible because like I, because the I christian was, god I, is sending I don't. I don't Christ believe in the Christian God. I don't. I've never been a fundamentalist Christian. I've always been so. I've been lib always been liberal. I've always had this general so like this sophistry idea of God. I've always had this kind of tootsie kind of kind of tootsie pop idea of God that he's 
all benevolent yet maximally powerful. Maybe he's. Uh, sorry, so hang on, hang on, Colin. I'm really, I'm really confused. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You said quite a lot of things there. Like you can be, you can be a Christian and not be a fundamentalist. You can believe in God and be a liberal. Like all, all I think I'm really interested in is whether you believe in God or not. Not whether you believe in like the same God that Westboro Baptist Church or whatever believes, but do you believe in God at all? I have lingering belief. I hope I have more hope that he's real. I'm well, more okay, hope so that, that was that was my last question. But I'm just saying, like, why would why would you hope that God is real? Like what Because I, I feel mean, like I've I feel like I was the most ostracized person, the most ostracized kid in every school I ever went to. Sorry to hear that. I got booed. I got booed at my graduation. I was the only person booed at my high school graduation when I walked the stage. It almost made me weep. And I knew uh -huh. that God, that I always thought that God was the one who got me the most. I mean, okay, so this is it's, it's a difficult situation because obviously I don't want to take away something for you that you feel like you've leaned on as an emotional crutch or whatever. And I am really sorry to hear that people have been horrible to you in your life in ways that you don't deserve at all. Um, but I, I guess, you know, we can say whether you had beliefs that you feel like got you through the time and whether you actually needed them to get through or not. But I guess... I mean, there's quite a lot of things I could say from here. Um, I, I, I guess one thing that I would want to say, maybe on the kind of more emotional side of it, if that's kind of where you're leaning, is I feel like you got through those difficult times on your own, and you are capable of getting through difficult times on your own. And I hope, hopefully, you're in a better position now, where you know you have people who love you and stuff, and people aren't as horrible to you. Actually, um, I'm not, but, Katie. I'm not. Oh well I'm I am really sorry to hear that. Um it's so what you're saying is that you do believe in that you hope that there's some kind of God because that gives you some kind of person who Please. believes in you and is nice to you, is that what you mean? Basically, yeah. The only one. So I, mean, I got I got banned I got banned from RFR for the good Lord's sake and uh, and and they, and they have me they have people that come on and give talks about no shunning. I don't know what RFR is. Sorry, recovering from religion. You got banned from recovering ah. from religion f for the Lord's sake. I, I don't know what you mean. What, said, what did you do? No, did, I said I got banned from recovering from RFR for the good Lord's sake as a colloquialism. I, I'm asking you, what did you do to get banned from recovering from religion? Oh yeah, uh, they just said I was. I got an email, uh, and they said that I was being too distracting and scaring some other members away, and detracting from um, the general uh, basic gist of what they do. Yeah, that's and what that they my said. My, what my personal you... problems were too systemic. Okay. What did you do that drove people away that they sa said this? They didn't say it in the email. Okay. Um, uh, I don't think I have uh, anything particularly useful to add uh, because when you say you're questioning your position on atheism and your position on atheism is that you don't see sufficient evidence for God, and yet you run around talking about how much you want there to be a God because you want you know, this God concept that cares about you and has your back because apparently nobody else does. Um, so there's, there's this position where you're, you're wanting there to be a God. And then you are like, I went to church and I heard the most pedestrian message in the history of church, but it seemed like it was tuned especially for you. It seems to me just armchair that you are in need of counseling and community, community and that uh you're finding some of that 
in church and you've tried to reach out for it in other areas, but for whatever reason, you don't seem to mesh well with RFR or whatever, you know, online thing or whatever else. I don't know if you'll end up meshing well with another church. I don't know if you'll find a secular uh, or a therapist through like the secular therapist project that might, might be helpful. Um, but it's wild to me that you called in previously about cosmological evolutionary stuff. And now it's about, Hey, this church said exactly what I needed to hear. So I'm starting to doubt whether or not I'm an atheist. Um, I don't know that there's anything at all that I can say or do that would be useful or beneficial other than check out the secular therapy project and continue to reach out to communities to try to find the one that you fit with best. And if it turns out that community wise, you fit better with a church, go for it. Um, there are plenty of great churches with great people and they're going to teach you stuff that's not true, but they're going to teach you other stuff that's probably just fine. Uh, you know, love, love thy neighbor and be good and do charitable stuff. And um, if you find a community that you fit with, I, I, I hope you do. But mm. I don't know that there's anything I can say or do that's going to be of any more benefit to you. I, I guess well, I have one I thing that I could offer. S sorry to cut you off. Um, like, I have gone through phases in my life where I have, like, not hoped, but wished that there would be an afterlife. Um, not like heaven and hell, because that whole concept seems horrific to me, but just the idea of seeing my loved ones again. And also, I, I think as strongly, just not ending. Like, I don't want to stop being. I, I enjoy learning and understanding the universe, and the idea that I will just lose all that one day is horrifying to me. Um, and it, it can be overwhelming at times. And, you know, I've, I felt like, oh, I wish I could just be religious and just believe in going to heaven. It's just such a nice idea. And, and just forget about the horrible hell pit because it's absolutely immorally horrific. But oh, yeah. I have managed to get into a place in my life for quite a long time now where I am not happy with the idea of dying, but I am happy with where I am in my life without feeling like I need to lean on this sort of crutch of um, needing an afterlife. And it's, me it's meant in this particular case that um, I am able to really focus on the life I'm living now and to enjoy my life for what it is to the most that I can within my ability because I know that one day it will just stop. And it, it causes me to you know, appreciate things like my cat and you know, where I live and, and just the smell of spring and all this kind of stuff, which might sound a bit overly emotional, but at the same time, it, they are great things and they are things that get me through the day. And I guess if you are feeling like you're in a position for whatever reason why you wish there was a God there, I mean, I can empathize in that and I was wishing that there was an afterlife, but also knowing, not knowing that for sure that there isn't, but having no evidence for there being one, and so having to accept that I can't believe in one until I've seen evidence has kind of given me, empowered me in a sense, not, not in how the previous caller was talking about empowerment, but it's given me the ability to find the happiness in what I do have and what I do know is there. And I guess if you are struggling for community and something that understands you, then you could be in a position where you kind of think, well, at least God's got my back. And then that's as far as you go and God is there for you. But if you just say, well, I don't have any evidence for God and God hasn't done anything good for me. <laughs> um, but there must be community out there. There are other people who are in a similar position to you. I mean, loads of people struggle from the community. It's a real big issue in society in general. Um, so then you're in a position where you're like, right, well, I can appreciate what I do have. And I don't know if you have pets. I don't, you know, hopefully you have somewhere to live and, and those kinds of things. But then you can say, right, what are my interests? What are the things that get me going? 
these are the things I can start looking for community in. And then you can start saying things like, what have I struggled with in the past? You know, maybe I am too quick to comment on people's appearance or something. I'm not saying that's you, just, just a random thing. And you could be like, because I know that there isn't going to be some God who comes in and saves me and scoops me up and makes, makes everything okay. I know that I need to work on my relationships with people because they are valuable. I, I've spent, you know, I'd spent a huge amount of my time when I was coming out worrying that I was going to lose all of the relationships in my life. And they were the most important things to me. And some of that is out of your hands, but some of it is stuff that you can do to at least, you know, go some of the way towards making a relationship. And um, I think maybe if I had felt like, well, at least I have God, at least I have the next life, then I would have been maybe less motivated and less determined to, to resolve that to the best of my ability. I'm not saying this is all right. in you. I'm not saying you are the reason you don't have friends. Not at all. I'm just saying that maybe having God as a crutch is preventing you from learning to walk. Sorry if that's a really cringe final statement, but no, it's not. Um, it's it's not cringe, Katie. Like, and Katie, you're so <laughs> gracious, and I appreciate your graciousness. Like, and Matt, you're cool too, and there's no hard feelings, you know. Uh, but like, I just and you're Matt. You're you're the one who ultimately got me. You and Hitchens really got me inspired to become an atheist, and uh, I just hope that one day I can get back there. It's like. But every time I get hit and knocked down, I just run straight back to God and a community that I can find him at. But then, like, when I say, when I come out as being bisexual or on the spectrum for uh, the LGBTQ plus community or trans, they hate on me and they get, they rag on me and they abandon me. And then I just go straight back to this liberal God that I created inside my head that will accept me no matter what. And uh, but I don't want to be. I don't want that. But and that's just the crutch. You, that's just a crutch. The the crutch could instead be you accept it. Like what what gets me through sometimes? I'm, I I don't know if you've seen my uh, output on Twitter and stuff, but I get a lot of hate from people, and there are a lot of people who you know hate trans people and stuff and sometimes it can seem overwhelming it can seem like wow i am surrounded by people who hate me and maybe everyone hates me and maybe i'm a bad person and you start internalizing it i've fought this off by rationalizing it and realizing that my position is correct as far as i know and that doesn't make me a bad person and i'm more moral than these people because i've rationalized the reason I hold these views is because I consider them more moral, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that means that ultimately, when I get into a difficult situation where I'm questioning myself or my relationships or or anything, I don't fall back onto some god which just tells me everything's okay. I fall back onto like this rational foundation that I've constructed, and and sometimes I just go through it all again in my head, and I'm like, no, I I am someone who like is deserving of respect and human rights like everyone else and i am someone who's just worthy of being loved and stuff and that is what like picks me back up you know if i if i fall over and i, I trip and stuff and that's true for you too you know you are someone who's worthy of being loved and stuff and that's something that rather than getting from some god that probably doesn't exist you can just get from yourself and just remind yourself that rationally that is the rational position so I don't know if that is the rational position, Katie, because there's something well, that says in the back of my mind. It. Maybe if you knew me, you wouldn't say that, Katie, because I'm too far well, too maybe cynical I wouldn't. and far too bitter. Yeah, but, but you can be you smart, would. cynical, so, and bitter and still like yourself. I'm I'm smart, cynical, and bitter too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you know. But uh, yeah, I appreciate your words, Katie. You're gracious and that. Uh, hopefully, you'll let me call in again. Maybe we'll talk about free will and that's. I got some theories on that no. and then how it's. <laughs> you like me? I know I've talked about that for too many years. Yeah. What's your favorite subject to talk about, Matthew? What what subject could you talk about over and over again? Snakes. <laughs> 
Snakes. Did you get any new ones lately? Uh, I, I don't know how lately, but, uh, well, I mean, some of them hatch out. So there'll be some more new ones. But I got to move on, Collier. Um, I don't have time to talk about snakes today because as much as I'd love to, it's the Sunday show where we're talking about well, things thanks, that aren't necessarily Thanks, Matt. Snakes. Thanks, yep. thanks, Matt. Cheers. Thanks, Katie. Cheers. Bye. Bye. I hope you find exactly what you need. And just just the, to comment on the name situation, because I've also seen some people in the comments. To, like People don't have to call in with their legal name or their given right. name or whatever. The, in fact, don't, especially if you have some difficult history with it or you're not allowed to legally change your name to your actual name or whatever. Just yep. don't, don't call in with a totally different name every single time because... Then, like part, because I was also thinking, oh, I know this voice, and then part of you is trying to reconstruct it. Whereas you just see a name like Omar, you're like, oh, it's Omar. <laughs> yeah, you know, even before Omar got it. through, uh, and and I'm sure Omar will it, it dismiss this as as a as a lie or um, uh, I don't know, whatever. I saw the name Omar, okay. and I was like, I think I've taken calls from Omar before, but because he's calling in, you know in a more anonymous way i wasn't sure but i genuinely didn't remember that we just had a conversation within the last week or so about slavery until omar started actually presenting the uh the things about it and then i was like oh and then the voice triggered in my head and i was like oh i know who this is now but before then it was like okay there's multiple omars on the planet maybe this is a different one uh but it's not it's the same douche the same Omar oh shit did time. i just call you a name i'm sure you'll love that as much as when i put you on hold we we got a couple more calls to get to uh lucas is calling from sao paulo pronouns are he him um something about uh being potentially afraid of death so lucas thanks so much for calling and i appreciate you waiting Let, let's see if we can i don't know give you some useful answer hi uh can you hear me okay just fine yep uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Katie, uh, for taking my call. Uh, second, uh, I'm from Brazil, so English is not my first language, so I'm sorry for any future... Uh, you're, you're doing take, better um, than some native uh, English speakers who call in. Yeah, you're doing great. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, yeah, uh, actually, my my question, is, there's a lot of a lot of overlap with what Kate just uh, talked about with the last caller. Uh, the thing is that I'm atheist. I've always been atheist since I can remember. Uh, but I have a crippling uh, fear of death and fear of the end, of fear of uh, not existing, of the void, whatever. And uh, that has been uh shaking my uh my atheism if i can say it like that uh to the point that i would sometimes like uh a little bit of uh respite i think uh, I, I would like some uh gratification some somewhere where, where i can look and and like oh th there's not an end but i think uh from from the last months i think of the last years uh i've been increasingly uh desynthesized the sense the synthesized i'm sorry uh about this subject about death and about existing and i've been feeling this dread that i would like very much to, to discuss with people but most of the people i have in my life uh, they always turn to God or they turn to some kind of uh, spiritualism that just doesn't vibe with me. So uh, whenever I try to return to a more practical or rational way of thinking, I just get this increased uh, fear. So, yeah, that, that's what I would like to talk about, what I would like to, to hear your thoughts on. Sure. Is this, Matt, is this something you've ever experienced? Because I, I no. when I was a kid, really, because oh, when, I, when I was a kid, I, I really vividly remember this, one of my sort of earlier memories. I remember getting given like a 
notebook thing for one of my birthdays. I was probably like eight or something. And I was like, I'm going to turn this into a diary that keeps track of everything I do in the year. And I was going through and I was writing down the years and I was like, 1999, 2000, 2001. And I was going through the pages and I got to 2009. And then the next page I turned over and I wrote 3000 because I didn't know like enough how numbers worked because I was like, 2009. And my mum came over and she was like, oh, Katie, you won't be alive in the year 3000. And I just like had a meltdown. I remember just crying. Like, as the first time I'd like comprehended that one day I wouldn't exist. And I remember like I've gone through fa- years of my life where I've just not thought about this at all. And it came up again a few times, like once when I was a teenager and, and once when I was maybe in early 20s or something. And I didn't have it again for ages. And I got to my 30th birthday and I was like, oh, is 30 going to be a big number or something? 30 came and went nothing, didn't care, didn't think about it, it's just another day. Then like 30 and 9 months, I got like hit by a train by this realization that I was going, like super, sometimes you have this kind of like um, moment of like clarity where you realize something, and I was like, I am going to stop existing one day. And it, it for me was very overwhelming, and it kind of sounds like what Lucas is saying, but I don't think everyone seems to have that. <laughs> and it doesn't sound like you no. have either. No, and I, I think partially I'll acknowledge I, I'm I'm undiagnosed, but I'm definitely a little weird, and I have some some Diagnosed atypical. Is weird. <laughs> yeah, it, I have some atypical views on things. I think one of the the, the reason for me not not suffering this the same way that others have is um, I was surrounded by Christianity from the instant I was born. And I walked down the aisle at around the age of five at a revival at our church to accept Jesus into my heart. I don't remember doing it. I know that it happened. and I've got the little gift. Actually, my gift New Testament that I got on that day is literally, uh, actually two of them, because one of them was uh, a gift from someone else. And this one was the gift from the church. I still have it in the original box. This was gifted to me by the wow. the pastor. So I got the, this, uh, or one of them's from my birth and one of them's from the, anyway, enough distractions of the crap that's around me. I never thought that I was going to hell because I was saved so young. And it was just a matter of fact, I never had a realization of or it wasn't an epiphany of someday you're not going to exist. It's like when 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 the concept was prevent, presented to me of, yeah, someday you're you're not going to exist, that's just de facto true. But I was also raised knowing that I would exist forever and my existence would just continue on in heaven. And so for a lot of people, when um, when they find their way out, that belief that's been injected to them by religion uh, has been such a foundational view that coming to the realization of, hang on, maybe I'm not going to live forever in an afterlife can be traumatic for people. Um, and in some, some case, I think Lucas is talking a little bit about this because for me, it was anytime somebody would raise the issue, it, my questions to myself were how much time have I spent worrying about hells for other religion or or consequences from religions I wasn't a part of? And what can I do about any of it? I have no reason to think that it's true. I don't see any way to find out that it's true. I don't see any path to correct it or change it. It's like if you thought you were living in the matrix and then you found out you had no good reason to believe you were living in the matrix, uh, but yet you've been so indoctrinated in this belief that you keep waking up in the middle of the night uh, of, oh, reality isn't real. I, I have known and I've heard of and interacted with people who, even after being an atheist for, for 50 years, still get nightmares of the hell that they were indoctrinated into believing when they were a kid. It did not impact me that much uh, or at all. So Lucas, to, to get back from Katie and I sharing how we're, slightly different or, or majorly different when you have your your moments of i you know someday i'm going to be dead and i don't know what's going to happen after and 
is it more of a fear of what you will experience after you're dead or an existential dread of not experiencing anything at some point? I think it's certainly uh, an existential dread of nothing, of of not existing. Yeah. Because you, you were talking about hell and, and these things. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, you go on. Go on. Uh, yeah, you, you were talking about hell and these things. And for a moment, I thought, uh, well, I would surely prefer hell than not existing because yeah. I'm quite fond of existing, right? I'm quite, uh, that, that's the only thing that I know is existing. And I, yeah, I went through some phases that I, I even thought about, like you said, uh, you were raised on uh, a place where life was eternal and you, you, will, you were already saved. And I almost, sometimes I almost think about, well, eternity in some way it's also very frightening because you think about how you are like socially and maybe even uh psychology uh, psychological uh raised to believe in endings or to believe uh, in th that things are segmented and when you try to consider uh, the eternity with your feeble human mind and existence well to me it it's, it, it also has a, a kind of frightening uh way that wow well, i'm going to see like the heat death of the universe and what comes after that you know what what kind of nothing. existence is there after death and yeah and the, the answer of nothing nothing you just uh, it, it's the answer that, that I believe is closer to my heart, it's closer to my critical thinking, it's closer to something that makes sense to me, the way that I perceive and understand uh, human beings and humanity and, and life in general. But I can't uh, forego of this dread, I think because I got to a point where I thought that death could be anywhere, like it could happen in time. Like in, in, until yeah. the moment that I, I end this call, I could be dead for any amount of reasons. So, and the, the, this thought of, wow, I'm existing and then I'm not, uh, I don't know, it, it causes me fear. I, I talk to friends that are atheists that they say, wow, it's just like, you know, when you fall asleep, you, you lose conscience, and then it's kind of like that, but you just don't care anymore because you're not even there anymore. But falling asleep has kind of a, a promise that you wake up in the morning and you remember the night before as yeah. death, you, you don't have that. So in a way, I have I... These, this vision. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. I was just going to say, I, I, I feel like Apart, like your fear of uh, eternity thing, I was like, I don't agree with that at all. Until you mentioned the heat death of the universe, if if someone was like, you could live forever and also choose like some other people or everyone to live forever, then I would just pick it. I would infinite doesn't stress me out at all. The idea of being infinitely trapped on my own is different. But everything else you've said, I I totally agree. Like I, a good example, I feel like I just worry about everything all the time. And a, an example of that is when people are talking about, I remember talking to my friends about surgery and they're like, <clears throat> oh, you can't worry about dying on the surgery table because like when you get in your car, the chance of you dying on the way to the surgery in the car is probably higher than dying in the surgery. And you don't worry about that every time. And I was like, what? Yes, I do. I worry about dying in a car crash every single time I even think about getting in the car. Like, whilst I'm driving, it's just a little thought in the back of my mind, just being like, you could die in a minute. Like, what if someone just comes out of nowhere and just crashes into society? Just constantly. That That is something that I have just always had. Um, and I find that that gets overwhelming, and I start having this 
dread in my life about dying and worrying about maybe I have illnesses and stuff starts getting to me when I am um, depressed or bored in a sense of not just like, oh, I've got nothing to do for the next hour, but I am trapped in something in my life where like, you know, work is unfulfilling, relationship unfulfilling, friends, unf all this kind of stuff. Um, and I don't have some kind of project or goals to work towards. And when I'm not reminding myself of how good life and stuff is. So I, I, I feel like I get all the stuff you're saying and my way of dealing with it is to let myself not think about it. And that's not to say like the dread is always there and I'm hiding from it and I just have to keep my brain busy. I do try and keep my brain busy, but I do stuff that I love doing. And I remind myself that because I've only got one life, that I should make the most of it. And that involves doing fun stuff, but it also involves loving people and, and my pets and remembering things and all of that kind of stuff. And when I'm focused on those things, um, the the dread isn't always there. <laughs> it just comes in little parts sometimes before bed when I'm tired. So I guess um, I don't feel like I can rationalize this away for you because I think one day you probably will just stop existing and I think I will too and I, I would choose not to if I had the option. But at the same time, what I can say is from experience, I am living my life having once had that dread shadowing over me all the time in a situation where that is not the case now. And what I would recommend is um, trying to let yourself think about other things. Like you've, you've obviously got some part of your brain which is overworking and it's very easy to, like if you think about it from a, like a um, neuroscience point of view, which you might be better off calling in and talking to Shannon tomorrow about this, uh, you could say I made a real mess of it, but when you think about the same thing over and over again, your brain makes that a really solid pathway and it becomes something that you then automatically think about more. So, I mean, that's how you get better at skills. When you do something over and over again, your brain makes the pathway stronger and you get better at them, but you can get caught in these like rumination loops, worrying about things. Um, and the, best way to deal with that is to break yourself out of it by focusing on the th other things. And maybe if you're a worrier like me, then you could instead of use your worrying energy for planning for something, plan a holiday or, or something, because that kind of uses the same thing as worrying. Um, because you've got to think of all the different eventualities and you know what happens if you take six pairs of socks for five days but then you drop all of them in a pond and then you've got to have enough money to buy new socks you know that kind of stuff is the thing i worry about all the time um and it just allows me to not constantly enforce these same like worry patterns so i've kind of gone off on a bit of a ramble here but um do you yeah. find do you think any of that is relevant <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean yeah in the sense that katie's rambling i mean i'm rambling we but, we, we yeah. have tried I, I, I'm personally frustrated, Lucas, because I, I I desperately want to empathize with what you're going through, and yet I, I have this this pragmatism that is very much a hey, if I can't do anything about it and I can't figure out what's true, um, it's frustrating for me. So, Matt, are you like? So, I was just wondering this: if you're on, so you you're racing for a flight and it's like an important flight because you're going to see your family for Christmas or whatever, you know, whatever your important event is. And you're like on the train or you're stuck in traffic and it's the train is going slow or the traffic's going slow. And you're like, I might not make my flight. Are you, I guess you're maybe the kind of person who's like, well, there's nothing I can do about it now because I can't get out of the car and run and I'm just no. in this traffic anyway. And, or do you worry? No, I, I, I wish. Um, so, it is, I, I will, in, in that situation, I will stew over it because I ha, either I have made a mistake in not leaving early enough and not preparing for reality. And so I will basically beat myself up for not getting my, or for, for allowing myself to be in that situation. Or I will also, and 
Yeah, Arden will back me up on this. Um, I fucking hate inconsiderate drivers with the passion of a thousand sons and every motherfucker on the road around me who doesn't use turn signals, who doesn't know how to fucking drive, who doesn't... who. They're the reason there's a traffic jam, and I want to lecture each and every one of them all day, every day. So, yeah, um, because I think that that is something that could actually be done. But if the but plane's possibly. broken down, you know. Uh, well, it, I, was it, once, I was once on a train from the middle of nowhere, Netherlands, to Amsterdam, and the train, whole train system got hacked, and they had to stop all the trains because the whole train network went down. And we were like between two stations and they were speaking Dutch on the tannoy. And I was trying to do Google Translate, like holding up to the speaker. And I got some of the bits of it. And it's just like, you can't get off the train. We're just going to see how long this will take. And I had left an extra hour early for this train, so I, uh, for the plane. So I was going to get to the airport with three hours to go. And I instantly was in maximum worry mode and i messaged my family and my brother's first response was just like well there's nothing you can do about it and i was just like i don't worry ah! <laughs> I, I don't i don't worry my my it's it's more about it, finding a way for me to process the situation but i don't worry because I, you know if, it's, if there's nothing else i can do to, to get back to you lucas my apologies because yeah sorry <laughs> and i will tell no, 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 stories no, perfect um uh... i would recommend first of all your English is perfect and beautiful and better than uh, a number of Americans that I've Thank had you. the Thank you so opportunity. Better than to, all to Americans, to. to be fair. Yeah, probably. We're a bunch of idiots <laughs> up here in the, in the United States. Um, for me, all I can say is that uh, I, I take a pretty pragmatic view on the hell thing and the death thing. And one thing that I realized fairly quickly is every moment that I spend worrying about an afterlife is a moment of the actual life that I have wasted. Because if I don't have a path to do anything, getting angry in traffic is cathartic for me. It allows me to vent and it allows me to say, next time do this differently. And next time plan for this. Um, or go on the TV show and explain to people how to properly adjust their mirrors or how to use a fucking turn signal and what, and why you're the, why I'm the guy that uses a turn signal in parking lots. Um, even though almost nobody else does so that people know what the hell I'm intending to do. I do. I do. Yeah, Indicate you. into parking spaces. Katie can drive my truck and that's, there's only like three people <laughs> that are allowed to drive my truck, but Katie can drive it. But anyway, uh, my, my pragmatism is the, Hey, I can't really do anything about this. And I don't want to waste a single second of my life. The, the day that doing shows like this is no longer of any benefit or joy to me, I will quit. And I don't see that happening. I've been doing it for 19 plus years or around that. Um, I, 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 I'm as empathetic as I can be with what you're dealing with of the, the sign, kind of existential dread. Uh, there's the old Mark Twain quote. Or, or attributed to Mark Twain, and I'll just paraphrase it, which is, I was dead for a billion years before I was born, and it never bothered me one bit. So if you cease to exist, which is what the evidence suggests, then that will be exactly like it was for the billions of years before you were born from your perspective, because there is no your perspective. It, there's, a, there's a video that just got reposted of me sitting down with uh, Jordan Peterson which ends with me exposing a problem in his thinking where he's trying to argue that the foundation of well-being, trying to use a foundation of well-being for morality, could be flawed because maybe it would be in your best interest to not exist. And I was pointing out that well-being requires being. If, you're, if you lop off my head and I'm dead, you have ended my well-being. You could argue that it may be that I persist on in some other life. Um, and so that might be better for me, but there's no reason to think that that's the case. And so the, the second being ends, well-being ends. And that was the, the end of that clip. But I genuinely hope, though, I mean, go ahead. It would be in everyone's improved well-being if Jordan Peterson didn't exist. So <laughs> I agree. Possibly. Sorry, sorry, Matt. Wait. Carry on. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Uh, so I guess I guess all I'm saying, Lucas, is that uh, 
I empathize. You're not alone. I hope there are that there's maybe, you know, psychotherapy.org or recovering from religion or a group um, where you can. One of the things is that if you sit around and you talk to all the other people who have these same sort of existential dread things, um, that's one useful tool. I agree with Katie. Consider calling in to Skep Talk tomorrow when um, Shannon's going to be on. Shannon's going to be able to deal with the psychological aspects of this stuff way better than than I am. And as you're experiencing something that I can't personally fully connect to, no matter how much I can empathize with how troubling it may be. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have much else to add. So I guess I got to stop there. Yo, uh, I, I really have two, two, two less things to say. Uh, first of all, it was very warming to hear both of you because I think uh, in a certain way, uh, there's always that that feeling that well, uh, at least I'm not the only one that that, that thinks yeah. these things. And, it, and listening to Katie, it, it was kind of like that. And listening to to you, Matt, I think that this kind of pragmatism approach would be something that I, I would strive to achieve. And even it, it, you like said about. Uh, venting on your car about traffic, maybe uh, venting about death would be enjoying life, you know, uh, enjoying the yes. time you have. Well, I would. That's why there's uh, the poetry have... rage against the dying of the light. Yeah. And I was, I was going to recommend a different art form, which is you should uh, get into death metal. Death metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good. So. I got yeah, just a recommendation. I, I like some... <laughs> I love that. I, I'm just going to go with Beyonce's new song, Texas Hold'em, because that song's fire. <laughs> uh, I'll put them both on my playlist. Uh, <laughs> awesome. But yeah, uh, I think I would take from our conversation that maybe I would like to act more like Kate until I can achieve what Matt has. I think. And that's, that's the goal, the I think. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> We're the dream team now, can we? Yeah. <laughs> Put the two of us together, we can fix the whole world. Oh, I did the wrong one. It's that I'm way. Sorry. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> all right. On that note, Lucas, uh, I got to let you go, but by all means, call back and let us know if that works out for you, if you find another way of dealing with this, because I've gotten calls many times over the years of people dealing with anxiety related to death, dying, experiencing death, being dead, afterlives, things like that. And I, I can just give the same answer every time because it doesn't impact me the way it's impacted other people because I'm the weirdo. But if you find something that's better, by all means, call back and, and share that because I, anything that's going to help more people needs to be the sort of thing that we're promoting on this channel. Certainly. And, and I already thought of, about an, uh, a next question relating to this topic that I think I'll say for uh, another show, but yeah, awesome. yeah, you it was, it was pretty gay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank awesome. you, Kate. Thank you, everybody that's listening. Uh, yeah. Ooh, Thank bye, you so Lucas. much, Lucas. And if you happen to bye, find bye. a Jan's hog nose, uh, uh, Xenodon hystricus, uh, send me a message because they're in your area and I want them. But... <laughs> Okay. Yeah, there's a, uh, I've shown it before and I've talked about it before. There is a specific variety of tricolor hognose that is um, native to uh, Brazil, Argentina, uh, and it is called Xenodon hystricus or Jan's hognose. Um, they are, I've only ever seen pictures of them, and I desperately, desperately want. Uh, this snake. I don't even know if it's legal. I don't know if it's possible to export it. I don't know anybody who's got any. I don't know what the breeding process is. I may never be able to have one. Just like we can't have Arden. What's the Fiji banded lizards? Not allowed to have them in the United States, but you can iguanas. have them in Canada. Fiji banded, or Fiji banded iguana. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you can have them in Canada. So when we watch Adam from Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, he's got his uh, Fiji banded iguana and is constantly kind of poking about how, well, if you live in the United States, you can't have this. And it's this really stupid reason. It's, I think it's got to do with treaties with like Fiji or Tahiti or something. Who know, who the hell knows what? 
but they're they're too gorgeous and we can't have them until we move to canada or to uh, england don't move to england this shit <laughs> i i love every i've been i've been to england many times well several times not many times um i've loved my visit every single time and i think one of my favorite things is that when i did an event um at the orpheum in london with uh sam harrison richard dawkins uh, i came out to open up and i i was talking about how previously when i'd been there i'd flown into manchester and then was working in stoke on trent and the way people in london think with respect to stoke is kind of how people in the united states think with respect to parts of new jersey or arkansas or you know things like that and so it's like hey i've been here before i love the time i spent in stoke and the place just started erupting with laughter uh but i was being <laughs> genuine i had a great time there i got to go out to warwick castle and i i i've loved it. i still haven't been to stonehenge i still haven't been uh but i've got to go to scotland it's not far uh, where i am stonehenge yeah i we will come one of the greatest someday. things one of the greatest things in the Southwest that a lot of people don't realize, and I don't know if this will mean much to Americans, but certainly Europeans, there's a, a cheese called cheddar cheese, which is objectively the best cheese and probably the best thing humans have ever created. And it's actually from a town called Cheddar, which has a really cool glacial gorge, so, like from millions of years ago. And uh, it's just near, fairly near Bristol. It's in the Southwest. And you can go there and they sell cider and cheese and you can just try it all and then you can walk up the cliff and all this ancient glacial madness around you and then there's just goats everywhere climbing up these vertical wolves and it's a cool place so it's worth coming there's so to much more Southwark. i want to see i had a great time i had a great time at cambridge i was supposed to go do a debate for the oxford union but that happened right when COVID hit and so they canceled it and uh, I haven't heard anything back from them. Who knows if I'll ever get invited to go do something with the Oxford Union. If you're at the Oxford Union and you were previously involved with that, if you reach out, I, I will say yes again, just like I said the first time, because I desperately want to come back. Uh, anyway, we've got a couple more calls to get to. Um, oh. Will in Texas has a new argument for why Christians should be pro-abortion, which is congratulations on one of the weirdest summaries of a call for the for this week so what do you got will how you doing yes hey matt katie thank you for taking my call matt the beard is looking fantastic um thank you so thank i was you. having a discussion with, credit i was <laughs> i was having uh, a discussion with one of my christian friends and you know i'm kind of like you i grew up in the church and it was later on that i, I lost my religion and I remember in my church that they always, I always wondered like what happened to babies when they died. And they always told me like, you know, there's something called the age of accountability mentioned in the Bible. And, um, you know, I've heard that a lot from a lot of the people that I discussed it with, cause that was always one of my number one questions. And, and, and I thought to myself, you know, um, the Bible constantly says that very few will ever make it into the kingdom of heaven. And from a Christian standpoint, like the goal is to get to heaven and, I don't know why they're so vehemently opposed to abortion when if if the thought is, is that an aborted soul goes to heaven. And if that aborted soul doesn't get aborted and grows up, if it's very few, it has to be less than 50 percent. Even being generous, I would say 40 percent. So there's like a 60 percent chance that that person goes to hell for all of eternity and suffers for all of eternity. But if it's aborted, it's a shot straight to heaven. Now, I know there's. Calvinists and other thing, uh, other um, people that that believe that they don't go to heaven, but the majority of the people I talk to think that they do. Yeah, I, so I so, I thought about this before. Sorry, actually, do you want to say a thing, Matt? I, I don't no, no, that. go ahead. I was going to say, like you mentioned, these other groups that maybe don't think um, they go to heaven if they're like aborted fetuses or whatever. But they, they all have some kind of cutoff point, some kind of way to get into heaven. Maybe some of them are like, oh, well, you just have to be old enough to know that Jesus died for your sins. And once you're taught that, then you'll go to heaven. And really, the most, as a Christian who believes in heaven, the most moral thing you could do would be to create some kind of farm for humans where, you know, if you just believe that fetuses um, go straight to heaven, then all you're doing is just 
fertilizing, you know, eggs and sperm, creating a zygote, or whatever, and instantly destroying it. But if you're someone who believes that children must need to get to the point where they're like self-aware and they can understand Jesus died for their sins, you create some farm that grows them up to like seven years old or whatever. You teach them Jesus died for their sins and then you instantly murder them. And if you could do this on some kind of industrial scale where you were getting like millions of souls into heaven a day, potentially, like you would be the greatest Christian of all time because you would have rescued, you would have got the most souls into heaven. That's like the single greatest thing you could do. I know that it says like believing Jesus died for your sins and loving God are the greatest things you can do. Sure. But you're doing that too. You're still going to heaven. If you know Jesus died for your sins, if you, you could set up some kind of self-replicating human cloning and murder machine, which didn't need human input and traveled the galaxy using the resources and other planets to create the machinery to build a farm to create teach and destroy as many humans as you can that would be you would be the you know you would have created one the most souls for god it would be the greatest thing ever in fact you could wipe out all other humans and then all humans would instantly go to heaven and then that's even better so yeah i'm on board with you <laughs> let's do it <laughs> that's really all i've got i'm just kind of i've just kind of wondered about the you know if the logic is sound there if somebody believes that if somebody believes that babies go to heaven the thing is they don't actually believe that because the people who say babies go to heaven are doing it because the idea of babies not going to heaven makes them uncomfortable but those of those who are opposed to abortion they don't care they're opposed to abortion usually because they don't value women as full people and they want some excuse to control people and to be disgusted by people and to treat people as lesser um or because they've been told to do it and they just blindly follow it once you get to like the th these arguments are great and i think they're fun to have with someone at the pub but if you actually get someone who believes babies go to heaven and abortion is bad and you lay out this argument for them they will just call you names or change a subject or lie about their position or say A equals not A. And that will be the end of it. In my experience, talking to hundreds of these people, I don't know if Matt, you've talked to any of who've gone different ways, but. Well, I've put on my Jesus hat um, so that people know this is. Um me channeling the old christian version of me so first of all will the bible doesn't actually mention anything about an age of accountability there's a passage in isaiah that is sometimes interpreted as suggesting that there is an age of accountability but the bible doesn't say what age this is or even confirm that that's actually the case with regard to uh salvation or responsibility it's uh isaiah 7 let me look uh, 15 and 16, where it says, He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. That's basically the sum total of this. Now, there's tradition within the Catholic Church and, and others um, about Jesus starting his ministry at 12. And so they're just like, well, that would be, a, you know, an age of accountability, but it's not a biblical concept, truly. Uh, but also, the, the concepts that are biblical is that God knows everything that's going to happen, and everything happens according to God's plan. So if you were to build this uh, soul farm factory that Katie's talking about, and it was successful, then either it, it's still part of God's plan, and nobody's going to get to heaven that God doesn't want to get to heaven, so either God's going to bless your server farm, or your, your soul farm, not a server farm. God's going to bless your soul farm, or everybody that you do there is going to go to hell because of some loophole, but God already knew it anyway. And so this notion that everything's going to happen according to God's plan undermines any attempt to change it or whatever else. Um, so you look at somebody like Andrea Yates, whose reasoning was, whose morality was, it was awful, but she drowned her kids because she didn't want them to risk going to hell. And if, if the doctrine that she had learned was true, that kids were going to go directly to heaven, it's the same thing you're, you're talking about. Well, we're, you know, Hey, might as well just abort them or just end their life the second they're born, because then they get to go to heaven to be forever. 
But the, the question then becomes, do you think you can trick God? Do you think you can do something that God isn't going to know about? And so when Andrea Yates drowns her kids, people can point out uh, this is immoral. I would agree. People can point out that Andrea is not going to be able to trick God. I would agree. But whether or not ki- babies are going directly to heaven is a, a whole other issue that nobody's talking about. But what you can't say is that Andrea Yates didn't love her kids. Andrea Yates gave up her own life and potentially damned herself in order to do, based on her understanding of doctrine, the absolute best thing forever for her kids. And there's not enough in the Bible or in the history of the church uh, to stop some of these potential loopholes that people think they find which is why the Catholic Church and, and others have, have announced that suicide is a mortal sin, that if you take your own life, you're not going to go to heaven. They had to come up with something. Otherwise, people were going to be like, well, I, I'm saved. I accepted Jesus. I've washed in the blood. Uh, I'm in my, my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm confident in it. And life fucking sucks. So I'm just going to end it and go be in paradise forever. The concept is so strong that they had to add something completely with, with you know, just an arbitrary foundation to prevent this sort of thing. It's so, yeah, you're not the first person to suggest this. Um, I think if I were putting my Christian hat back on, it would be like, yeah, you know, you're sending people to heaven, but God already knew you were going to do that anyway. If in fact, they yeah, I just wonder about, you know, I think if I ever spoke with somebody and they said, you know, well, babies go to hell because they're not saved, the conversation would just be done. Um, so, yeah. but on a, on a different note, just real quick, the, the prior caller, you know, his, his worry about what happens after I have a much weirder one where I, I worry about coming back, you know, like if, 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 if this goes on for eternity, then maybe I come back and as a different person or something like that. And, and life pretty much sucks for most people for most of history. So I worry about that. I also worry about like this fair and just world where you come back is everybody that's ever lived. So you're the slaver and the slave, you're the oppressor and the oppressed. And it's a really irrational fear, but I think about it way too much probably, but thank you guys for taking my call. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks. Will. have a good Sunday. Good Sunday from the Sunday show. Oh, Katie, I think you're muted. Um, I was muted. I was going to say, Will, don't forget that life has sucked for most people throughout most his- most of history so far. And maybe over the grand scheme of human existence, which could be a billion years for all we know, maybe 99.9% of people have good lives. And so your odds of coming back as someone who just lives in some kind of pod which just injects chemicals into you so you think you're like you're snowboarding and eating a cheese sandwich at the same time all the time, Maybe pretty much guaranteed to be that. So I'm gonna. We have one more call to get to, and, and Katie, you've seen be the good call. One. I have. <laughs> I would like to request permission from you to address this caller first and quickly, and then have you come in and correct me. Yeah, do it. <laughs> Sweet. All right. From Washington, pronouns he him. Edwin is an atheist who has a question about. Uh, wants to understand mine and Katie's position on the idea that religion and trans ideology are both constructs that have no concrete scientific evidence. Is that accurate there? Yeah. Hi, Katie. Hey, Matt. How are you? I'm doing well. Good, thanks. I'm, I'm going to give you my quick answer and then I'm going to shut up. Um, religion exists. Transness exists and trans ideology exists. Religions make claims which may or may not be supported by science, may or may not be true. They have to be assessed independently. Trans ideology is, in fact, scientifically supported in that we know which treatments and which societal actions benefit or harm trans people. The notion that there's something not scientific going on is uh, bizarre to me because the people who are generally making that claim want to argue about a very narrow definition of biological sex and saying this is co-equal to gender, when even from the biological sex part, they're still wrong about the binary and the facts of all this. But 
-hmm. what we're talking about when we talk about gender in the sense of what, what you would be calling trans ideology, which is not the way that I would phrase it, and I don't know how Katie would, is at the intersection of biology, sociology, and psychology. In there, there's a durable psychological construct that is something that we have created about roles in society that we fit in based on some things that are real and some things that are not real. But it's undeniable that people fit or don't fit psychologically into the sociological roles, irrespective of what their biology is. And Fair that's, enough. That's um, my whole take. To, to be sure, this isn't necessarily a position, well, it's not a position I accept, but um, I guess what I was going to say in relation to that is, so some people will say things like, there's no scientific evidence for gods beyond a social construct, um, which I think is true. And then there's people will say, likewise, there's no scientific evidence for gender beyond a social construct. And so they'll kind of pair those two things together um, in so, order to critique. So, yeah, so Edwin, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I think that I'm going to avoid the term trans ideology because I would say that as a trans person, my idea of what trans ideology is would be things like trans people should have equal rights and trans people shouldn't be murdered for going on a date and things. Whereas I think most people, when they say trans ideology, they seem to mean like trans people existing. So I, I always stick clear of that term um, because I think it's rubbish. I don't think mm -hmm. there is a, a shared ideology amongst all trans people. Like there isn't a shared ideology amongst all left-handed people. Like all left-handed people kind of want to write with their left hand, but if forced at gunpoint, lots of them won't. And my, all trans people kind of want to transition, but if forced at gunpoint, won't. And that's like what we have in common. Um, mm -hmm. But to, to address this kind of like parallel with religion, like we could, there are some claims that are made by some religions that are true in some of their texts, but there are other core claims that they make, like our God is real, which we just cannot test. There is no evidence for, there isn't evidence against all of them. There is evidence against some of them, but in general, that's what kind of what we're talking about when we say things like, Religion makes untestable claims. Like, I'm not going to try and claim that they, all of their claims are untestable. But in general, it's things like, our God is real. I'm going to say there's no evidence for that. And usually, then people say things like, and like you said, people might claim that gender isn't real. And that's a very um, clumsy claim because gender has lots of different meanings. I'm not going to go into some big mm -hmm. academic bullshit answer. But generally when people say that, sorry, my cat's trying to walk on the keyboard, what people mean when they say that is um, that trans people aren't real. Because when we say gender isn't real, that kind of says to me things like, you don't think, like pronouns are gender, and that's something that we observe all the time. Like I can say he and I can say she. Like the way people present in society, there's some kind of, dimorphism between men and women and whether we agree that's made up or not whether we agree it's entirely mm -hmm. social or entirely biological any it's still real but so that that's kind of uninteresting what is interesting really mm -hmm. is whether trans people are real whatever that means and i think the only way we can really understand what that means is and the way i always look at this is mm -hmm. Are there some kind of testable claims we can make about trans people? Like we can make testable claims like that that's what science is. It's like coming up with a hypothesis and testing it and then seeing if we can create a model of the world that we can then make predictions which turn out to be true. And mm -hmm. with something like God, there is nothing we can do. There isn't even a test we can come up with in a classic theist thing would be is to call in and be like, well, what evidence can I give you of God? Because you'll just say, well, what if it's aliens with superior technology or something? And I'd be like, well, well, yeah, I mean, I might, because I don't even know what, how, you know, supernatural things aren't testable. That's, that's kind of the, the problem with the claims. But there are loads of claims that we can make about trans people and ones that we can test and ones, importantly, that we have tested quite a lot and have really high prediction rates on it. So for example, 
we know that medical transition and social transition together or individually benefit some people and don't benefit some others. Um, and in fact, don't benefit is putting it mildly. There are some people, most people, were they to transition who would suffer if they were to be forcibly transitioned either socially or, or uh, medically. Um, and we mm. are able to predict who that is with diagnosis criteria very accurately. In fact, we know that because for all medical treatments, um, and not just medical treatments, but all like treatments that also includes like um, therapy and psychological treatments and stuff, but all just treatments that we administer to people, all of them have a misdiagnosis rate and all of them have a regret rate. Like that's just inevitable. There's no way we can 100.00000% diagnose mm -hmm. someone for sure with anything, even like a broken leg. Because there are times when it's like a hairline fracture and you won't necessarily see it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just a fact of diagnosis that you're not always going to be able to diagnose something correctly. But we do know that we can diagnose who is going to benefit from transition really accurately and much better than many other things that we just accept as normal. Um, and the regret rate for trans healthcare is incredibly low, which it wouldn't be if we weren't good at diagnosing. And wouldn't mm -hmm. be if we would if there was nothing here at all. If we were just a randomly administering transition to people, and there was no kind of um, realness to what being trans is, there was no there was no thing here. There was no such thing as gender identity, which is the mm -hmm. term that the medical establishment has settled on. Um, mm -hmm. If that didn't exist, then we wouldn't see people really benefiting or suffering from it. Uh, they would suffer mm -hmm. from potentially the side effects of the treatment, but like, why would, why would anyone care about being a man or a woman if there was no such thing as gender identity there? And uh, just to give you some examples, cause this is like common knowledge in the, in the trans world, but not for most people. But, um, unfortunately there was a time when, uh, they hypothesized that there was no uh, as Matt, Matt puts it, like, what was the term? Like, durable psychological condition or whatever. There was no, yeah. basically, yeah, they, they basically theorized that gendered or identity didn't exist. And they just thought whether you're a man or a woman and how you see yourself as a man or a woman is just purely based on how other people treat you and what you're told you are in society. Mm -hmm. And they had um, several examples where they did just forcibly medically and socially transition some kids, which is utterly horrific. Um, there's one famous case called David Romer, who you can look up. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. R-E-I-M-E-R, -E -E I think. Um, and there was, I think it was like a failed circumcision on some young kid, which is uh, utterly disgusting. And basically they messed it up and they were like, oh, well, we'll just create, uh, we'll just do a genital um, reconstruction surgery instead and turn this young boy into a girl and just tell them they're a girl and we won't say anything about it. And there was, you know, they've done this horrifically several times. And in all of the cases, uh, it didn't go well at all. And lots of them tried to transition back. Um, so there are examples, like evidence we have of this gender identity being a thing that cis people have, and cis here meaning someone who isn't trans. So it's not just like a trans thing. It's not like most people are totally cool, whatever happens. And mm. some people, for some reason, really want to transition. It's that if we know if we were to just pick 100 people randomly from the earth and forcibly medically and socially transition them, the odds are <clears throat> that about a third of the time, one of them would really benefit from that. And all the rest would really not benefit from that and they would suffer. Mm. Um, and so when people say things like trans ideology is like religion, I feel like there's quite a few steps I have to take, which is why you get one of these long answers and you're like, oh, it's just kind of rambling on. What I would say mm -hmm. is we absolutely all the time make predictions based on decades of evidence about trans people, which 
relies on the hypothesis that gender identity is a real thing being true. And that is when it comes to healthcare and social transition. Um, there are other claims about trans people that you can also make, which are also testable. Um, like, for example, treating people like the the classic one is pronouns. I mean, we can we can totally point out that pronouns are just made up. <clears throat> they are definitely an example of gender, which is just a social construct, because there are some languages which don't even have pronouns, uh, don't even have gendered pronouns. I mean, maybe there are languages which don't even have pronouns too, but there are some languages, for example, Finnish, which doesn't have gendered pronouns. So no one there is getting distressed by being called the wrong gender pronoun. But in places where they are gendered, we know that it will cause people, both trans and cis, distress if they're called the wrong ones, usually. Mm -hmm. And maybe there are examples of that not being the case, but it's a, it's a general pattern in society. And that's like a prediction we can make. And if you were to just pick a bunch of kids from a school and start calling them the wrong thing, they'd probably all get upset. Um, so I, that's a bit of a long answer, okay. but I have to kind of wade through when someone says trans ideology and try and find something to point to to say in general this claim is nonsense but if you were to say because some people would then come back and be like oh but none of that addresses the fact of whether trans women are men or women or something else and i would say mm -hmm. yes it does not it does not address that claim at all um and that claim is like some ontological claim that I will happily argue, but it's not something we can actually just measure. Like we can make a prediction <clears throat> if someone is experiencing these symptoms, we can diagnose them as being someone who will benefit from transition. We can measure a load of stuff. We can make a prediction and we know that we're generally right based on evidence. When we come to who is a real woman or not, there isn't just a thing we can measure. We don't just have like, you can't just zoom in and see women written on our cells or something. We can see, zoom in and see chromosomes. And if you want to have an argument about chromosomes or gametes or anything else, uh, we certainly can, but it's going to be uh, futile. Um, however, the point is that the claim of who is a real woman isn't actually addressed by mm -hmm. science. It's uh, it's a social thing. So I don't know. There's a long answer. How do you feel to that? <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with, I think everything you said, I just had a quick question about the, you know, you may basically mentioned that there's an implicit assumption when someone says um, gender is a social construct related to, to transness um, that uh, trans aren't real, right? That there is no, yeah. you know, that they're not a real identity. Um, this is one that I struggle with a bit. So I'm wondering, you know, for example, lot, lots of social constructs are still, you know, real in their effect in the world or, or are still real in the way they impact the world. So um, something like money is very real in the way it changes people's lives and changes how yeah. um, they engage in society and their socioeconomic status, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I think I struggle with that part of it to, that I don't, to me, I don't really, um, you know, I, I'm a privileged cis -het white guy, so it's easy to kind of talk about this stuff um, kind of from a, quote, neutral perspective. But I guess for me, I think about this stuff and I wonder, um, you know, I don't really care if, if, if it is socially constructed or not. I think people uh, deserve rights. Um, I think there is an acceptance to say uh, in the scientific community that it is, quote, innate or biological is kind of often the assumption people make and i don't think that's an assumption you can make but i might be wrong on that again i don't care necessarily what it is whether it's social or, or biological or innate um but i'm not i i guess i haven't been convinced that it's not social um which is fine but anyway that's so so well when when people say gender i think like to like steel man perhaps the tough position which is like trans exclusionary radical feminist position which is not the same as like the general transphobic masses position um they would say gender is a construct um and they would give an example of something which i would totally agree with which is 
some people feel, most people, it seems, in the West, seem to think that girls should grow up wearing dresses and liking pink and Barbie, and boys mm. should grow up getting muddy and playing football or something. And that kind of gender roles that they push onto people, um, sometimes lightly, but pretty much universally, it's very hard to escape them because they're in films and uh, adverts and schools and books and everything. That kind of stuff ends up just being a usually, I mean, it does have negative um, results for men and boys, absolutely, because it has things like boys don't cry and causes them to repress their emotions and stuff. But generally, it's even worse for women and girls. And it's things like, you know, you don't need a career, you should stay at home and you should do all the housework and, and this kind of rubbish. Mm. And that is included when people say just gender, Co a contextless use of the word gender. If someone says, what do you think about gender? And they're not some raging transphobe, I would assume they were talking about that. And I would say, yeah, it's bullshit. Let's get rid of it. Boys and girls should be able to like and do whatever they want. Um, stop pushing people into things. But then they would mm -hmm. then go one step further to the point where they end up denying the science part, which we were previously discussing about gender identity. And they would say the reason that people want to transition isn't actually because of this one internal concept you have of whether you're a man or a woman, etc. Um, it is in fact only due to social pressures. And they end up constructing like four, five, six different reasons why someone might transition. And the, the common examples are um, that a girl would want to be a man because men are treated better in society. And she might think, oh, well, maybe if I become a man, then people will stop sexually assaulting me on the train on the way to work. And so I'm going to take hormones and change my entire right. body and introduce people differently. Um, and that one. I, I personally think is ridiculous because on its face, because who the hell is changing their entire body for that reason? Um, and also it doesn't explain trans women, et cetera, et cetera, but it's the most convincing, but then they can't really mm -hmm. say the same for trans women because then suddenly why are these people wanting to become women? So then they have to say, oh, well, it must be about sex. So, you know, men are obsessed with sex. And so some of them just are, so attracted to men that they want to try and trick men because women attract men better than gay men and, and so they construct all this nonsense and then oh, well, not all of them are attracted to men so all oh, the rest of them just must be perverts and then oh but some of them are asexual so and, and they end up creating this big kind of mess and, and that inevitably results from the claim that all of this stuff is socially constructed and the issue is mm -hmm. is that whether it's socially constructed or not, and when we say gender and what we include, it's such a big mess, it's kind of meaningless when you're trying to zoom in. And what you instead need to do is look at individual concepts. And we need to just zoom, super zoom in on every single thing and be like, um, whether boys are allowed to wear dresses, is that good or bad? It is bad to ban boys from wearing dresses. It is bad to shame boys wearing dresses. Boys should be allowed to wear dresses. Girls should be allowed to wear dresses. It is completely meaningless to put any kind of value on this at all. It's stupid. Let's get rid of it. Next. Right. Do mm -hmm. we have any evidence that medical transition benefits people? Yes. And it doesn't matter. Com that is completely unrelated to the dresses thing. That is completely unrelated to pronouns. It's completely unrelated to who is a real woman. Okay. So that means that we should do this medical transition thing. Now let's look at pronouns, which is actually doesn't quite fit into either of those two categories. Pronouns are something we made mm. up. Maybe they're a net negative on humans. Maybe they're a net negative towards feminism, but not in the same way that like banning girls from wearing trousers or climbing trees is. Um, so we have to look at like all of these different things individually and assess them for what they are and not just try and lump everything we don't like into the word gender and be like gender bad because that is often that is like the top level apologetic for opposing trans rights um i'm attempting to steal man and destroy in a matter of seconds <laughs> this is interesting 
Um, I was curious about going back to this pairing between religion and, quote, uh, trans ideology that you seem to get a lot uh, currently. Um, And this kind of relates to some stuff Matt has been, you know, dealing with, I think, over the past several months. You know, people like, for example, uh, I think it's Pine Creek Doug, I think, and a guy named Andrew Wilson. Um, I'm wondering whether or not you guys could speak on the idea that so-called the four horsemen of, of new atheism and some of the attacks on Christianity and people's identity as Christians, of course, um, some of, some of these attacks were, you know, people were quite offended within those communities. Now I'm, I'm agnostic. Um, so it's not necessarily affecting me, but I'm wondering if Andrew Wilson, Pine Creek, Doug, people like this are a response to that. So they have their own way of being like, you know, you're, ideology is absurd nonsense as well kind of a thing right um it's like a retaliation to the ways in which new atheism um i think psychologically harmed a lot of christians weird yeah this is is incredibly weird because first of all andrew andrew wilson is a fascist christian not an atheist i don't know why he's getting lumped in with anything related to new atheist New atheist. I think. Um, sorry, my apologies. I, think what, I was what, trying to say that he's a response. Sorry, go ahead, Katie. Yeah, I just uh, one thing I have noticed, and I, I wonder if this is what you're talking about. Is a lot of Christian fundamentalists love to call everything else a religion. They call atheism mm-hmm. a religion. They call being LGBT a religion. They call Democrats a religion, and it almost seems like just saying, "Ah, oh, but being LGBT is a religion," is to them an argument uh is is that the kind of thing you're talking about edwin yeah i'm just i just it seems as though there's a reaction towards you know some of the stuff with um the four horsemen and and kind of you know berating um christian religious worldviews as kind of being absurd or nonsensical or you know not rooted in, in reality and it seems as though a whole culture of christians or maybe former christians or atheists developed out of that and some of them are like the, the people like Andrew Wilson who use the, tr- the trans thing as a way to attack atheists because it seems as though they're offended by um, some of the vitriol by some of these types that like, like the four horsemen that, you know, have become were huge in their time and um, were exposed online like like never before. Of course, there was atheists around, but. The ways in which YouTube and and well, you know being able to get this message across just exploded. Yeah, it's kind of funny because at least Richard Dawkins. I don't know about the other three, but Richard Dawkins is a transphobic bellend who probably agrees in full with all of these Christian wackos on trans people. Um, so I I think that trans like trans people are the thing that people are panicking about at the moment. Like 30 or 40 years ago, it was gay people. Before that, it was black people being allowed to be equals. Before that, it was women voting. Like every generation or so, we seem to have some big panic about some new group of people. And all of the transphobic Christians are saying, this is the result of atheism. And all of the um, bigoted atheists are saying, that being trans is like a religion. And all of mm-hmm. the like men's rights activist anti feminist types are like, this is a result of feminism, which is the truest of all the takes. And then all of the transphobic feminists are like, this is a result of men's rights activism. And basically, they just blame trans people on the group they spend all their time hating because to them, it's like every ham, every nail is a, everything's a nail when you've only got a hammer. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a bit like that. Um, and they're not rationally addressing these claims individually. Or in the case of all of them, apart from the atheists, they're not addressing any claims rationally. And then in the case of specifically Richard Dawkins, he is not addressing anything to do with trans people rationally. So, Fair enough. That makes sense to me. I was just curious what you guys thought about those uh, those ideas, because it is funny how those... So religion is often paired um, with trans ideology by atheists and theists as kind of, you know, either one being absurd or both being absurd. Um, And they seem to be linked together in debates quite often. Yeah, it's just it's just dumb. And usually it's a group of like, it's all cis people, room full of cis people looking at two cis people on the stadium on a podium or whatever. And one of them will be like, 
trans ideology is like religion, and then the other one would be like, trans ideology is like atheism, and then they both just say trans right. ideology a lot without even really saying what they mean. Or everyone there is either disgusted by trans people or neutral. It's just, it's just an excuse to, like, express their disgust about trans people because we are the thing in the news at the moment. Uh, probably for another ten years. So enjoy it. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. That's all right. Call in to the Transatlantic Call In Show next time you have a trans-related question. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Great, Matt. Sorry, I did a lot of talking. I hope that's uh, no. That's what you. That's away. exactly what we expected <laughs> to do. Uh, thanks, Edwin, for the call. And by the way, for anybody else with further questions about uh, trans-related issues, you can tune in to the Transatlantic Call In Show. Uh, on Thursday, you know your head just keeps getting lower and lower. Oh, I, are you, you're scratching down your chair? I think your your camera had moved, but you're, no, you're like me. More you're more comfy. I just look like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait, let's see if we can both get down to where our heads are just like at the bottom of the thing, and get it as, like this. There we go. There's your this thumbnail for next position. time, Arden. <laughs> Thumbnail for the next show. All right. On that note, uh, let me pull up my my notes for all of this. Um, first of all, huge thank you to everybody for tuning in. Uh, as you all know, tomorrow on Skep Talk will be Shannon Q with my Adkinson. Adkinson, sorry. Uh, Wednesday on the Hangup, I'll be here with uh, Dar the Magic Skeptic. Thursday, Transatlantic Call-In Show will be Arden and Alexander. I'm about to pass out from actually being on my knees here. Uh, <laughs> I, I got out of the chair. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so Thursday, Transatlantic Call-In Show will be Arden and Alexander. Friday, we're expecting an episode of Hostility with John Gleason and Rick, Rebecca Vitzman. Our screener today was Dragon, Mods, Kalashia, Stephanie, Cookies, Amarg, and Dylan, and more. Thanks, everybody. Uh, as a reminder, you can go to linemerch.com, and there at Line Merch, not only are there uh, hoodies for the, the, the most elite and most the people who love us the most buy hoodies. Um, they're expensive to produce, but we wanted to make sure they were there, and so they're going to be expensive to get. Um, I don't even have mine yet, but that's, uh, we're, we're going to be corrected, because how, how am I not going to do a show uh, without you know, that hoodie and your gay homie at some point? You can support us right here on YouTube by clicking like, clicking subscribe, sharing the content, sharing the shorts, letting people know what's going on. Click those buttons. And you can also go to qnaline.com or patreon.com slash call the line. Uh, all of that's available for you to be supportive of this. Katie, do you have anything to add before I wrap us up? Um, I, as I was just saying in chat, um, without wasps, humans would die out. That's what I want to add. Oh, wait. <laughs> without wasps, humans would die out. All right. That's your They're homework assignment, everybody. <laughs> your homework assignment, everybody, is to go and research wasps and how and why humans would die out because of it. Figure out whether or not figs actually contain wasp eggs or not keep all of that ready and then tune into the transatlantic call-in show on a week when katie is there <laughs> send in super chats to either correct her or ask her questions for clarification because it's good bug stuff but I'm thanks ready. everybody for tuning in and a huge thank you to the lovely and talented wonderful art and heart down the hall who's doing the uh production stuff for us uh so today I, I I can't do hashtag Team Arden because Katie's here and we had a wonderful I time. I got rid of doing Katie wonderful... since you flipped me off. Oh my god, we just <laughs> moved moved Katie right off the show. Fuck you. Uh, up. <laughs> yeah. So when Katie's gone, I can do hashtag uh, Team Arden. But today, for the period of the show, huge hashtag Team Katie. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of the Sunday Show. Can't wait till we get a chance to do it again for all the rest of you. patreoncom slash call the line. Get your support in, share the word, do what you can to keep us from getting stealth hidden by an algorithm of evil from YouTube. <laughs> but for your A game, if you actually have a belief in God, be like the callers today and promote good conversations without it getting ridiculous. Except for you, you can fuck yourself. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs>